It's time for Twit This Week in Tech. There is a lot to talk about, including the new coronavirus, the novel coronavirus. It's closed Mobile World Congress. What's it going to do to iPhone production and, and the future of conferences in general? We'll also talk about augmented reality glasses. Apparently, there's a pretty good kind. And is Google's new OS called Pigweed? Hmm. It's all coming up next on Twit. This Week in Tech comes to you from Twit's LastPass Studios. You're focused on security, but are your employees? LastPass can ensure they are by making access and authentication seamless. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twit, This Week in Tech, episode 758, recorded Sunday, February 16th, 2020. Face masks and fear. This Week in Tech is brought to you by FreshBooks, an easy-to-use accounting program designed specifically with you in mind, the small business owner. Try it free for 30 days at freshbooks.com slash twit. And by Worldwide Technology. WWT's Advanced Technology Center is like no other testing and research lab, with more than a half billion dollars of equipment, including OEMs like Dell EMC. And it's virtual, so you can access it 24-7. To learn more and get insights into all that the ATC has to offer, go to WWT.com slash twit. And by ExpressVPN. Protect your online privacy with one click. It's that easy. For three extra months free with a one-year package, go to expressvpn.com slash twit. And by Health IQ. Health IQ uses science and data to secure lower life insurance rates for healthy people like you. To see if you qualify, go to healthiq.com slash twit and take the Health IQ quiz. It could help you save up to 41% on your life insurance premiums compared to other providers. It's time for Twit This Week in Tech, the show where we cover the week's tech news with the best panel I can assemble on short notice. Uh, jo <laughs> joining us right now for the first time on Skype, usually Alex is in studio with us, but he's now moved to Rhode Island, and uh, he's coming to us from my childhood home, the beautiful Breakers Mansion in Newport, Rhode Island, Alex Wilhelm. And you have a new job, Alex! I do, yeah. I am. Uh, I am back at TechCrunch.com, uh, my my old home, and now my new home once again. Uh, and it's been about two months, and it's been lovely so far. General really assignment reporter. What do you cover? Um, I'm covering the startup market and venture capital nice. trends kind of broadly. I, I, I will admit that I bias a little bit towards the late stage market as opposed to the early stage, but certainly there's a lot going on. Um, so I'm quite busy and uh, enjoying getting back in the groove, as it were. You don't mind actually working for a living instead of just editing stuff. You know, actually, what's really funny is editing is probably more stress, but reporting is more work, and I'd much <laughs> rather have more work than stress. So I'm liking the switch back uh, that's, over. That makes sense. Is that is that right, Daniel Rubino? Daniel's also here. He's the yeah, executive um, editor at Windows Central. That means you have to work, or do you have stress? Yeah, although I'm not very good at editing. <laughs> so oh. I edit in the, the programming sense. You don't ever want me to grammar check you because I will uh, – miserably fail in that you're regard. not well in the old days they'd have a copy editor to do that we have that now yes. you do yeah. oh yeah we have you have a managing editor and we have a couple of duty editors who wow. thankfully handle all that and grammarly has got a long way to thank you this. grammarly yes. the copy editor of choice hashtag <laughs> sponsor yep. for the data <laughs> hashtag sponsor for the data generation great to have yep. you uh, daniel also with us from cbs dan patterson from CBS. Great He's to senior, see you, as always. Senior Leo. producer. Producers uh, are not, a, uh, they're not, they're more working f folk. folk right? Oh, always. Yeah. I, I'm effectively a reporter, but a uh, reporter with a producer title and uh, embedded. So I report to and through CNET, uh, but we have wonderful colleagues, as we'll talk about later, who do uh, gadgets, cell phones, right. uh, that kind of thing. At CBS News, which is I report there every day and I report through them, I report more on the core technologies. Uh, so AI, cybersecurity, big data. Uh, Were the you very of busy Iowa. talking about the shadow app during the Iowa caucus? Yeah. You know, uh, strangely, so I grew up in Iowa uh, and we, we actually put my parents on there to give a, a an authentic take from uh, Iowa. 
Uh, and we, you know, we are CBS News. We are OTT, uh, cbsnews.com slash live. If you want like smart, hard news and not like pundits yelling at each other, our analysts do I a really good job. I actually have been looking for that. Both Lisa That's, and I is, have kind of gotten sick of the 24-hour news channels because they yeah. don't do news so much as uh, commentary all the time. And, so and this is often obsessively about one little thing for hours. Right. Well, as you have to do, you know very well that if you're 24 hours live, you have to you have cover to things time. sometimes. Yeah. And with with love and respect to our colleagues at other networks and other media companies, we do live news with smart analysts really well. It's cbsnews.com slash live. It's free. I don't mean this to sound like a plug, but if you really no, want to see like something. segments yeah. of like here is what's going on with coronavirus. Here yes. is what's going on with stuff that is undercovered, underreported, yes. but is still news. We do this really well. It It is streaming all the time um, with real anchors, real news, real correspondence. But is it audio, it's audio, not video, right? No, it's video. Oh, it's, it's, it's uh, TV. 20, 20, yeah, it's live TV. CBSnews.com slash live. Oh, wow. Um, wow. So this is just, it is like, like it's just news. It, it's just news. I remember uh, so news. Remember no that? Pundit. Remember that? Right, You'd have right, news exactly. like they'd say, here's what's going on. Right. It's that. nonpartisan. So if you want, this is what I do 24 hours a day. Uh, and my colleagues do exceptionally well, which is smart, hard news I love it. Uh, in a nonpartisan fashion. You got a new listener uh, or viewer. Yeah. So and my colleagues at CNET are wonderful as well. You know, the CNET YouTube channel is fantastic. It is a place to go to not just be uh, entertained, but edified. I mean, CNET's YouTube channel is a ton of fun. I just spend more of my time reporting on the uh, technologies that influence the news. Well, and I remember, Dan, you, uh, you know, kind of made your name uh, embedding during the, uh, was it 2012 election or the 2008 yeah, election? I, Leo, as everybody on this panel knows, um, the, we, the media industry has its ups and downs. Yes. And I've been very fortunate uh, in 2008, 12, and 16 to cover tech on presidential campaigns. Right. So that's New Hampshire primary, South Carolina, Florida, yeah, Iowa, yeah. Uh, and the conventions. And I always try to focus on, again, nonpartisan, but here's how tech is influencing the world around us. Here is why tech is not just a vertical that is you know full of business stories but is deeply intertwined with every news story that you interact with uh that is what's happening with technology i think as your show has evolved that is definitely one of the dominant themes that i've seen with twit over the last 10 years yeah i don't know if it's a it's a good thing or a bad thing but you know uh, that's fair <laughs> it's certainly <laughs> fair uh i feel like tech reporting used to be about things <laughs> And now it's more about people, if that and and society than it used to be, which I think a lot of our listeners say. Can you just? It's funny. I got an email yesterday from somebody saying, "Can you talk less about phones on all about Android?" And it's like, I'm sorry. What do you want to hear? <laughs> what do you want to talk about? Uh, so we can never make anybody completely happy. Uh, and then I hear people say less politics, more gadgets, and then people say. But the problem is, I think that tech has now become. It's a different thing than it was 15 and 20 years ago when I started. And and uh, we talk about different things. And Well, for instance, Mobile World Congress, which normally uh, the conversation is what new phones are going to be announced next week, what's going to happen. Now the conversation is how c the coronavirus, COVID-19, has shut the conference down. They decided not to go ahead and do it because um, uh, too many people had already bailed, frankly. At some yeah, point, it seemed like only reporters were going. Oh, sorry. Go yeah, for the it. reporters with nobody to cover. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> were you going to go, Alex? Was that on your uh, agenda? No, no. I'm not a, uh, a huge phone guy, but I, I just kept seeing people cancel their presentations. And at some point, really, it was only like eight reporters I follow on Twitter that were still planning on going. And maybe they would have their own party. Right. Uh, but it certainly wouldn't have been the, be good the time event to it was go. supposed to be. Now's the time to go to Barcelona for sure. Uh, and the pricing has dropped. <laughs> yeah. Daniel, night. were you going? Yeah, I was. Um, it's funny because I've been taking off to the last couple of years from Mobile World Congress once Windows Phone kind of went away. Right. Uh, but then, again, we went last year because Microsoft was there with HoloLens 2. It was a big announcement, big, yeah. Right. 
And they're going to be there this year again. And what's interesting about Mobile World Congress is the phone stuff has become almost less interesting as everybody does, like Samsung does their own separate announcement, um, as we saw this week. But now we're starting to see with connected PCs and how mobile technology is more than just phones now, right? So uh, Mobile World Congress, in that sense, has been interesting to watch it transform. It's IoT, it's 5G, it's phones, it's computers, it's handhelds, and now you know, as we'll talk about later, foldable phones and devices like this stuff is like really exciting. So um, I was kind of disappointed, obviously, a lot of reporters were too about Mobile World Congress. But as Alex was saying, as soon as some of those companies start dropping out, Amazon and at t it just started snowballing. And then it, it, the conversation became, all right, who's who's canceling next? Should we start going? And once that starts, you know, I feel bad for GSMA. They really didn't have much recourse here. And, you know, they tried putting on the show. But, you know, once you have all these big companies drop out and that that air going around that about, you know, should this continue, it's hard to recover from. It, it stinks for I don't feel bad for at t Amazon, Microsoft, forget those companies. <laughs> they have tons of money. They, they're going to be able to fly their people around and do their announcements. It's about the small startups. Yep. This is really their event where they get yep. to kind of get a make or break moment. And they don't have that now. And that's real unfortunate. I wonder what the future of conferences holds. Uh, yeah. I mean, a conference, if you think about it, is, is worse than a cruise ship. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you get in so many ways in so many ways you get more people uh it was uh, more than a hundred thousand people expected at mobile world congress they're all in a few meeting rooms they're all shaking hands they're all talking face to face that's what a conference is 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 is, is that person to person connection and it's a breeding ground for viruses we're very lucky ces was not hit by coronavirus that could have been a nightmare scenario and then yep. people will take it back with them, right? Wherever they go right. to afterwards. I mean, you're yeah. literally creating an, an infection point that's quite scary. Um, I think we're starting to see the economic impacts of coronavirus. I mean, uh, I was going through the, the rundown. I know we're going to talk about iPhone production at some point. But, like, this is the sort of thing that begins to snowball into real economic impact. It's canceled flights. It's canceled hotels. It's canceled spend, canceled ad spend. I mean, this is a lot of money. 100,000 people is no joke. And it's one There's example. It's a half billion dollars for Barcelona. That's what's there you half go. Half billion and Foxconn is plants are just not uh, in fact they've they instead of making the new iPhones which they were rumored to be working on new iPhones they've been making face masks surgical masks um, we're not Good doctors doing we're not experts on this thing uh, so I wouldn't, wouldn't you know dream of asking you if this is a, a reasonable precaution or not I'm getting the sense more and more from the people I talk to who are following this, who are physicians, that it is that China has kind of buried how bad it's gotten and the potential risks of coronavirus. And so uh, apparently uh, I just uh, talked to somebody earlier today who said China shut down. There is nothing yes. going on. No one's going to the movies. No one's going. You, it, the streets are empty. People are staying home. Speaking of the New York, York Times articles. articles. Yeah. 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 Uh, they've done tremendous coverage, as well as the Daily Podcast has really done a great job of taking you inside what's happening uh, and not just reporting, but kind of giving you a, a human feel of what these cities of 11 million people feel like when they're shut down. Yeah. Um, I, You know, we've been preparing for this. We, did, we thought it was the zombie apocalypse, but uh, we've been preparing for this for a few years. I hope we are well prepared for at some point there will be a 1918 style uh, pandemic and because uh, in the modern world compared to 1918 people travel everywhere freely constantly uh, it's a very scary uh, scary thought true I wonder if but at the same time things have gotten better in the medical world so maybe it'll be kind of a balancing act I mean it won't get much worse I, I, I'm trying to be an optimist about this because China as we said is locked down like 760 million people according to the New York Times and the rest of the world's working very hard kind of in conjunction with one another to, to figure out a vaccine and so forth. So I'm trying to be an optimist. I don't want to get all pessimistic about this, but the, the 1918 example certainly is uh, pretty darn terrifying if that hit today because, as Leo said, the spread would be much more well, rapid. The, the than reason 1918 was so bad is it was the end of World War One. You had a lot of troops coming home, so they did, in effect, spread it throughout, and millions died. Um, and I don't you know... know what this is going to look like, but you're right. In, but we're simultaneously better prepared and, and less prepared. We're yes. more at higher risk and better prepared. Go ahead. And it really tests this idea that we've had in technology, in large part because the the economy for the last ten years has been uh, pretty good. 
But this idea of just-in-time delivery, that not only are the right. supply chains, uh, but the distribution networks are all stacked in a way that you can order and acquire almost anything. And this is because of these interrelated uh, economies. And nobody keeps anything in stock. Everything stock, is done right. just in time. So any hiccup Including along antibiotics. The, right. Any hiccup along the supply chain affects the whole supply chain. Everything comes to a halt. Uh, I'm, our next big conference is coming up in San Francisco in two weeks. It's RSA, the big security conference. Already IBM has withdrawn. Ugh. Uh, they withdrew yesterday on Friday saying uh, the health of IBMers is our primary concern. I don't know if that's overreacting. I mean, we do have, I think there's one or two Bay Area, I think there's one Bay Area case of coronavirus. But any conference that brings people in from all over the world, especially from China, uh, is, I guess, to be something to be worried about. The problem is IBM is a platinum sponsor. So withdrawing even in the RSA says, well, that's only 0.79% of the total number of attendees. Mm. Okay. <laughs> but this is how it begins, isn't it? Uh, yeah. I was just in San Francisco uh, last week and I wasn't sure what to expect in terms of face masks and, and, and fear. Uh, but I was, I was happy slash worried to see that no one was wearing face masks more than uh, I'd seen historically in the city. I only just moved out. So like, yeah, I'm, I'm still relatively up to date, but uh, in the airports, uh, Newark and, you know, Providence and SFO and even flights and even on the ground, just nothing. So there yeah, doesn't it's, seem to be a, it's a lot not of an American thing. We're just not into yeah. the face mask thing. It's kind of weird. It's Should very we much be? a cultural thing. I mean, guys, I know, again, you guys are Costco not epidemiologists. Were, were all wearing face masks. The guys at Costco. The guys were all... at Costco, this, I was there this, this week in the, in the East Bay, and there were several Costco employees wearing face masks. I guess yeah, and just I... anecdotally, it's been hard to get on the New York City subway without seeing Ooh. a handful of face masks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I can guess imagine. if I were going out in public, I might wear a face mask. Why not? Let's be prudent. Yeah. 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 And there's debate about it, too. I think it's better for people who may be infected to not spread versus those who uh, are worried about catching it because I don't know. There's some you debate know, because I, when you there, have a mask on, moisture builds up and it's actually a better breeding ground. Like right. there's like some debate about the You need to rotate your masks, have five or six yeah. in every few minutes. <laughs> and but, I think the people that I've seen wearing masks were actually people who were sick rather than people who were afraid to get yeah. people sick. Well, I'm no yeah, expert. We a colleague I'm not an epidemiologist. Uh, initially, they said the coronavirus is too heavy to be worried about airborne distribution. Watch surfaces, wash your hands. The latest thing I read from WHO is it is airborne. A mask could be helpful. You should yeah. still wash your hands. And, and you know, uh, stay home, Alex, General. Alex, to your point of optimism, I wonder if you will see, at least around the venture and startup communities, a shift, a reorganizational uh, shift in how people work. If this pushes more remote work and if it optimizes the efficiencies of remote work and as a result, maybe startups that do just that, not just create remote software, uh, but optimize and really push what you can do um, remotely with teams. I don't know. Maybe just yeah, being a little too optimistic, but. That's ironic no, with IBM, so. who's been, they reversed their policy of remote work and have made all their 350,000 employees go back to hubs and mm -hmm. get rid of this. We make and people come to work here because we found that people who work at home don't, don't do anything. <laughs> so so that is the classic view. But I, I want to go back to Dan's point about uh, startups and remote work and all of that. It is increasingly common for startups to have offices outside the Bay Area, even if they're headquartered there. That's been a trend that's been going on for some time. Yeah. But I really think the remote work trend exploded when uh, software got a lot better. Between Slack and Zoom, you really do have a, a really high level of uh, fidelity for remote work to kind of keep people in sync. Um, but I, I'm curious if we'll see a, another layer of innovation uh, for like remote conferences, for example. There was a thread on Twitter about that today because so many conferences are being canceled. Maybe we need to kind of let go of the idea that we all need to go to Barcelona for NWC, even though the food's good and everyone seems to have a great time. Um, maybe that's just not the way to approach uh, product releases and so forth down the road. Video chat's good. I mean, we're all four here chatting in real time. and it's, Yeah, we don't know, have to breathe well. on each other. It's, you know. The I don't have to downside. smell Leo for once. You know, it's nice. <laughs> <laughs> the only downside to that is I, I think is that, uh, you know, a lot of this in terms of reporting, even deals being made does happen in sort of, you know, outside of the main events and, you know, chatting with people off the record and all this. And that you lose when you have like official, you know, com um, you know, streamed conference type events. There's a uh, lot. It's just, there, that face-to-face -face is kind of important, isn't it? Yeah. Very important. 
Um, yeah. And if you're you 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 mentioned the classic case of a small startup that is hoping that Mobile World Congress will be the place they can make their debut to the public. There's a lot of press. Maybe mm -hmm. they're going to get some traction, and that's an opportunity lost. And I don't know how they can duplicate that over the internet. You just you're swamped over the internet. No, and making the point you just brought up about um, things being kind of in the background and so forth, my favorite CES story that I have is I was talking to Microsoft before CES. This was probably like 2015 or something, so back in the day. And uh, I asked if Satya was going, and they're like, no. I'm like, okay, cool. That's fine. I won't try to get any of his time if he's not going to be there. And then I was there, and there goes Satya blasting by me with like a whole entourage of people. And I'm like, what the hell? They're like, oh, he's not officially <laughs> here. He's just talking to some people. And I'm like, that's the same thing. Anywho, people really do show up and do that kind of back channel stuff. So I, I don't have a way to replicate that, but certainly it would be cool if there was a backup option maybe for conferences. Yeah. If they do have to cancel for whatever reason, they do have something other than just nothing. Which How about appears virtual to be reality? Out. Yeah. Remember, <laughs> yeah. remember that Facebook had that really horrible virtual reality world that you would go into and nobody had any butts or legs or whatever. And they still <laughs> have it. <laughs> they still have well, it. Well, I. I was just with a startup in uh, Zurich who is doing exactly that. They have offices in Hong Kong, in South America, in North America. And it is maybe a little ludicrous with how technology is now, but I think five, seven years from now, this could be far more common. And they were their entire workday. I know everyone looks nerdy with a uh, VR headset on, but everyone was sitting around a table with a VR headset on working remotely with colleagues all over the world. It was fascinating. Oh, yeah, there are quite a few companies working on that technology. So I don't think it, it just gets into that whole thing about VR and catching on to is, the mainstream. Would HoloLens be, could it be, it could be used that way. That's the kind of the thing that yeah, Microsoft's Yeah, they do have the hollow, trend, hollow portation, they call it, where they're working with Skype and stuff like that. You know, so mix, that's a more mixed reality type situation, which could be interesting for demos. Um, yeah, there's opportunity there, right? So it's, uh, there, if any group should be able to solve this problem, it should be tech conferences, like especially yeah. mobile ones. So, you know, there's hope there, I have but, to uh, wonder, you know, it's hard to predict where, which way this is going to go. If it ends up being a global pandemic and millions die, which is a possibility, I think maybe something will happen. Other, But otherwise, I think people just forget about it as we forgot about SARS and MERS and, and, uh, and just, you know, next year, everybody just go to conferences again. Or what do you think? You think this is a long term, the beginning of the end for conferences? I no. think it depends on you know what Alex is talking about with the economy. I mean, so we're hearing a lot of implications for China. We we saw you know a lot of companies, especially tech, reporting their earnings in the last two weeks, and they're now accounting for the coronavirus for next yeah, quarter in the projections. Said, yeah, this is going to be an issue. Yeah, in production. Yeah, yeah, and so you know once that starts to happen and slows down like that, could really have dramatic impacts. There's also the other story that we'll probably cover with China, you know, which is a surveillance state, and but this is a case where they're starting to use their surveillance technology to help in this situation. This is the dangerous thing about privacy and security is when you find that one instance of like, oh, this is actually good use of this intrusive security state because uh, mm -hmm. it helps you know protect people. It's an app, right, that reports. Isn't that when people get scared? And, and, yeah. and this, is, this is, that's why 9-11 really yep. hurt our uh, country because the effect of it was we got scared. And so once you get scared, then you support security over uh, freedom, over liberty. And, uh, well, you, you mentioned this. China has a close contact detector app that uh, you, they encourage you to download on your phone. You do a, uh, you scan a quick response code on your smartphone. And then the app, once it's registered with a phone number, you enter your name and your national ID number, and then they can tell you if you had close contact with anybody who has coronavirus because they know where everybody else has been. They know where you have been. Close contact means you were in the same train car with somebody who has coronavirus, or you, uh, if you were on a plane, you were within a few rows, three rows of an infected person, or, I mean, they, they really know everywhere you've been. And, and, I don't think they see revealing this as a disadvantage. This might be seen yeah, as a good thing. Like, yeah, and a behavioral beta test for what could be deployed mm -hmm. in the West or other places. Mm -hmm. And if we get scared enough, we might take it. Yep. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, we, yeah. 
America will. I mean, I, I, I think there's a there's always going to be a contingent of the U.S. government that wants uh, more control and, and stuff like this. Uh, That's the problem is it starts, oh, we're going to protect you from coronavirus. But the end game is and we're going to keep an eye on everywhere you go, every time you go anywhere and there will be no more dissidents. Yay. Protests are over. Yay. And then, and then you wonder what happens when this collides with the anti-vaxxers in the United States, if even a <laughs> vaccine comes out for this. Right. So it's like well, there's um, and then you have fake news and all this. Like yeah. I mean, there's a lot of potential here for some just really nasty stuff coming out. And, I, you know, I want to be an optimist like Alex, but. You know, there it can go both ways. I think and it's, my optimism it's kind of is scary. waning. Well, the more we talk, <laughs> uh, it's going good. We're depressing, slowly. Alex. That's our goal here. Yeah. America's <laughs> response to the 1918 uh, flu epidemic, uh, in part, was to force people to vaccinate against the flu oh, yeah. and other there diseases. So when the anti-vaxxers start being forced by the government to take vaccines. Twitter will be real fun. Well, <laughs> and we'll, yeah, oh, we'll be we see these trends of disinformation floating across sock puppet accounts and bot accounts floating yeah. across Twitter, Facebook, and other social networks. And this is a real issue because these forms, I mean, sock puppets and bots can push trending topics high enough that they reinforce pre-existing or at least seeded ideas yeah. with a mass population. And then when that is constantly reinforced, uh, and we see potential conspiracies like what we're talking about here with uh, intermingled with real outbreaks or real things of high stakes importance, then the potential for disaster is exceptionally high. I'm old enough to remember, though, when the United States got together and eradicated polio that, yeah. you know, it used to be people were afraid to go to the movies mm -hmm. because it was so easy to get polio. Uh, there are still people today in iron lungs because they got polio in the 50s and they can't breathe on their own and people yeah, were really scared people were very very scared and when the salk vaccine came along there was a universal movement not just in the u.s but all over the world to get people vaccinated and polio was eradicated you now, know why though because back then you could trust certain institutions that trust authorities institutions office. yeah and now you can't, right? So well, this is kind of like the big we, threat is that it, even if this stuff comes out, you know, people are going to choose not to to believe it. And that's, I think, what's going to get challenging. Wow. Yeah. So actually, I take it all back. I'm now in favor of VR conferences. <laughs> Let's just move to that immediately. <laughs> yeah. And uh, can, I, can I go back to the VR thing just for a minute? I wanted to bring something up because I've changed my view on VR in a way that I think I've talked about on Twitter before. And I, I, I'm now a VR optimist. No, sorry to go back to the positivity thing. But like I was at a friend's house who's a huge nerd and they did an awesome VR setup and I forgot to play with it. And it was mind bendingly better than I thought. So small note there, but I thought that was tr just Awesome. And you didn't so have the urge to erp VR. up or anything. It didn't make you nauseous. Nauseate. No, and I'm blind as a bat, and it was fine. Hmm. Uh, I played the Beat Saber thing. That was Beat Saber is fun. Yeah. Yeah. I was hype. <laughs> I am still not high on VR. <laughs> I'll be I'll be the last guy to go down on VR. Mixed okay, reality is gonna be the real key. The it's whole style. Reality. Yeah. Yeah, that and like, you know, I, I'm really a big fan of North, a Canadian startup. They do glasses that look like normal glasses, the tiny projector. Um, you know, they're almost, I think, way ahead of where they should be on this time kind of thing. But that, I think, will be the breakthrough technology. We can that do could that, be years so. away, though, decades away even. I mean, well, North is already selling version one. Actually, they stopped selling version one because version two is about to be announced. And it's, I mean, this is a doable wearable technology today. It connects up to your Android phone um, or iOS. You wear a ring to control it as a little navigator. They, they call these focals. Yeah, focals. Yeah. And it, it's actually pretty. Now, and what's cool, too, is it have doesn't you have a camera. Have, have, uh, have you used them? Check out our yeah, we review, have a review on Hands On Tech. Anthony reviewed them. Uh, yeah. He liked them, right? Did he like them? Twit.tv slash H-O-T. Thank you. 61. Uh, did he like them? Do you remember, Karsten? I can't remember. Yeah, he keeps I mean, wearing them. He must have liked it's them. It's still a, it's still very much a a first draft. Uh, but they're small. Thing, I mean, they look like spectacles. You can have your the prescription. Best so far. Um, so have you worn them, uh, Daniel? Did you? Have you tried them? I, I haven't, but uh, Michael Fisher has and did a, a pretty extensive review of them. And I, I like it that they look like regular glasses. They have big temple pieces. Yeah, uh, and, and that's the version one. Version two is supposed to be slimmer, and lighter, more comfortable. So it's know, a heads-up display on the glass of your glasses from the inside. So it's a little yeah. projector. So unlike uh, uh, the uh, Google Glass, you're not looking at a screen up above your eyebrow. Unlike HoloLens, you're not you're not kind of looking through a mail slot at the world with stuff projected on it. It looks like it's it's able to put that just right up on the glass. Um, yeah. 
I I always thought this. I agree with you. I always thought, and I call it AR, but I guess mixed reality is probably more appropriate. I always thought this was a much more compelling argument than Beat Saber in a yeah in a yeah. VR helmet. Well, fine. So I'll just just crap on my awesome VR. I, I will not, say, I, VR, I will wear those focal things because I'm an enormous <laughs> dork, and they don't look that uncool. And I would love to have a HUD in my digital. You can put the stock market in your glasses. Like, come on, that's yeah. wouldn't that be awesome? Yes, I want this. I, you know what I really it's want so is Daniel Suarez's reputation view, where you look at people and there's a little bubble over him that says, "Oh, that's Mike." You know, he comes from Highland, California. He's in the dairy business, thing. and he is 99.8% trustworthy. That kind I mean, of thing would be really cool to have. That's where I think Microsoft will use LinkedIn, honestly. Oh, maybe you that's why they spent oh. thirty thousand billion sure. dollars. On LinkedIn, what is what do they spend? Twenty billion on LinkedIn? It was a huge amount of money. Yeah, I can protect. Hard, hard uh, to think, hard to figure how they're going to make that money back unless it's all data, man. I mean, that's a huge, huge repository, and it's one of the only few social networks you can go on and actually right. have serious discussions. It's, a, it's the only decent social network. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, you can buy that with some facial recognition and mm -hmm. some augmented reality, mixed reality glasses, and you walk around at a conference if we still have conferences, <laughs> and you can just ID people, see their info. But I now mean, we have. Now we have this tension between what's possible with big data and the com combination data and, and government and people very nervous about what's possible yep. and t wanting to regulate it, wanting to cut back on it. Uh, and I fear that, you know, what you just talked about, yeah, they got all this face recognition data. Will they ever be allowed to use it? Yeah, so that's where, you know, this uh, Google came out, what, a couple of weeks ago uh, saying, hey, we finally support uh, regulation of AI. Well, they have and no choice, based. right? Yeah, and Microsoft's been ahead of that game for like two years now. Brad uh, Smith has come out and he wrote a book about the whole topic. And, you know, so that's that's a smart way. Like Microsoft at least was smart enough to go like this is an. There's a lot of opportunity here, but if we do it wrong, this is going to really screw up everything. And so, you know, I think these companies being ahead of the game and going, let's call for regulation. But you really got Facebook on board with this, right? They're just still the ones that are sticklers on all this privacy stuff. Whereas, you know, I would say Microsoft, even Google now is coming along. Apple, of course, is I would say there too. They're pretty good with security and privacy. But you got to get like companies like Facebook who are just still that outlier, who are just kind of driving a thorn in everybody's But you can't really well, do this stuff unless you're willing to combine databases from a variety of sources all the things privacy advocates are most afraid of or at least have an outside it really is there needs, a way to do it to safely could apple do it and so see i think that's why apple's ai and siri are so far behind is they're not willing to terrible. do that yeah what uh, Microsoft's proposing is an outside agency, government agency that basically certifies what you're claiming on the security aspect of your AI or facial recognition and how it works. This would have really been useful, you know, for this week for the uh, the, the Democratic caucus. Yeah, where they made I, an I mean, app. Oh yeah, let's put more technology in Iowa. Right. Yeah, I'm a, I mean, They're like, I, I really love a lot of people at Microsoft, and I think that they many of these people are very sincere when they talk about having third party or ombudsman type authorities. Facebook has made similar noises, as has Google, Apple and the other major yeah, tech Facebook players. Facebook now has this the governing problem, board, right? Yeah, right. The problem is that many of these things appear uh, very nice, uh, prima facie, superficially. But when you dig below the surface, they seem fairly cynical or a design uh, to get ahead of regulation or bend regulation in sure. ways that don't threaten the business models, but do allow them to say we are doing X, Y and Z for the public interest. That is not a statement intended to denigrate the people at Salesforce, Microsoft and other places calling for these third party boards. I just want to see them as the 3D chess that they are and that the motivations might not be as altruistic as they'd like us to believe. True. No, that's definitely true. Yeah, because otherwise they don't want, you know, to have, you know, government hearings and Congress and laws being passed where they're not they don't control the message. Right. At least this way with Microsoft and, you know, Google now they're getting ahead. They can kind of control the message a bit. And uh, you're right. You know, they can control yeah. the regulation, to, which would favor them. You know, so it's important. Let's take a little break. We've got a great panel. I, I think we could talk about anything here, and it would be uh, informative and fun. Alex Wilhelm from TechCrunch, now at TechCrunch, back at TechCrunch. Great to uh -huh. have you. I'm going to have to uh, take a still of your background and look at all the books you're reading. My goodness. Uh, this is... This is my wife and my library. It, it goes a little bit further, but uh, so they're not all mine. Is that Fowler's most, English of Usage Over Your Right Shoulder? Uh, the two-volume set? It looks Tell like. Tell me it. when to stop pointing. <clears throat> nope. Oh, left. 
Left, there, no. no, no, right, right. If right. you're not watching the video, I'm sorry. This is not <laughs> sense. Left uh, up. Uh, we're playing, we're playing a game. Anyway, nope. thank you okay. for being here, Alex. We'll figure that out later. Back. Also with us, Daniel Patter Dan Patterson from uh, CBS. Uh, let me give. Let me do this. So you're every day. You're on this new CBS News thing. It's CBS News. Uh, CBS. Tell me what the URL is again. It is. So I work work through CNET, uh, and they are great. But we are cbsnews.com slash live. CBSnews.com. Really slash excited live. about that, and I want to hear you on a regular basis on that. That's awesome. CBSnews.com slash live. All right. Well, I want to hear your coverage of the elections, the tech and the elections, things like that. I think that's great. Oh, right. We had the source code, the the early, so like early Tuesday morning uh, during the Iowa caucus, a source of mine sent me the source code and some video from the Shadow app. No And then kidding. other sources of mine at the DNC, well, formerly the DNC at now third party organization, started to leak a bunch about acronym, uh, the company that funded them. Right. And they said pretty vitriolic things. These are These are people who are tech insiders at the the uh, formerly Democrat partisans. Um, and the app itself, we took it apart and we had experts look at it as well. And there was some, I mean, it was fine. It just looked like your Code Academy project, uh, right? Uh, well, they, you know, they paid a whopping $50,000 for it. Uh, <laughs> I'm amazed it ran at all. We spent we spent $75,000 with a with a company in India that was going to make a Twit app. Never got anything useful out of it at all. We were so embarrassed by it, we didn't even tell anybody about it. We just ate the money and went on. Uh, I don't know what you get for 60. I guess uh, they they Iowa also put in 60, so maybe they I mean uh, Nevada, so maybe they got something, I don't know. It doesn't sound good. What they got was an embarrassment. Yeah. Really. Well, yeah. That's an embarrassment all around. Yeah. I oh, I want to hear more. We'll talk more about that with you, Dan, because I want to hear your your the background on that. I, this is this is good. This is why you, you're going to go to CBSN from now on uh, for all your tech news. No, no, not for all your tech news. <laughs> you tech. Come, come go here. to CNET. Please continue tech. to go to Twitch. And CNET and all, <laughs> yeah. all, all the good tech places. News. Daniel and Windows Central. Daniel Rubino, executive editor at uh, Windows Central. I can't believe it, Daniel. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting in my office yesterday, and Lisa said, do you have a Surface I could use? I said, what? She said, I want a Surface. I said, yeah. Nice. <laughs> yeah. She said, I want, I want an iPad, but I want it to run Windows. I said, I got a Surface Go you can borrow. So it's getting there. We're getting there. Getting Still there. some you know, it's not quite as good as an iPad, but uh you know I, she said I want that thing Bill Belichick uses. What is that? <laughs> yeah, that's a sur just surface pro. I know, right? I'm yeah. teasing. <laughs> <laughs> uh we uh, are brought to you this week by Fresh Books. Uh I have to say I have a real soft spot in my heart for Fresh Books. I started using it way back when, when I used to come up to Canada and, and do the call for help up there in Canada and I'd have to invoice them in Canadian dollars and I'd have to send them expenses. Oh, Canada. And and it was just a pain. But Amber MacArthur told me, she said, there's a startup in Toronto. You're going to love it. It's called Fresh Books. It, it helped me do my invoices, beautiful invoices. It started as invoicing software, but I have to say, really, it's accounting software without you doing any accounting. That's the beauty part of it. Use FreshBooks to create beautiful professional invoices. You can, as soon as you start using FreshBooks, your clients can start paying you online. They can actually pay you from within the invoice. That's amazing. Based on that, by the way, you'll get paid like twice as fast. That was my experience. And then because you've got fresh books and the invoices, you also that's accounts receivable. You also have the accounts paid. You also have your expenses because I was putting the, using the fresh books app to take pictures of the receipts, put them right up into the invoice, keep track of it. It'll even dial into your bank and download expenses. So essentially, you're, if this is the genuinely easy to use invoice expensing and managing your books program if you're a small business owner or a freelancer as i was you're gonna love freshbooks 24 million people have used it now four and a half out of five stars on get app small business owners love freshbooks i loved freshbooks it lets you focus on the reason you got into business not on invoicing not on accounting and man when tax time comes you will love it that you can get all the reports you need uh it automatically combines expenses billable time yes you can do hours on that they have a you could put a timer in there. You can have different prices for different projects, even if it's the same client. You've got client profiles. You've got automation for recurring invoices. No matter what you do, FreshBooks can can 
transform the way you run your business. And I, for me, this was always the hard part: was the the bookkeeping, the the, the accounting, the reporting, the tax time stuff. It was the stuff I wasn't any good at. FreshBooks really saved me. Stop. You can also stop chasing after the money your clients owe you. I'm, it, I mean, it starts with being able to take online payments, whether it's credit cards and ACH, ACH transfers. That's in the U.S. only. Get you paid twice as fast. You'll also get notifications the minute your client opens an invoice. So no more saying, oh, I didn't get the invoice. They'll automatically send late payment reminders. They'll bill late fees. Uh, they just make it easy. FreshBooks, it's easy with great Toronto-based support. They are the nicest people ever. I just love the FreshBooks team, and you will too. Make it easier to run your small business with FreshBooks. Save time, plan for the future. Just even just knowing day to day whether you're making money or not. I mean, that's just awesome. Freshbooks.com slash twit. If you put this week in tech in the how did you hear about us section, you'll get 30 days free and we'll get, you know, a little pat on the back from Freshbooks. That helps us a whole lot. So thank you for supporting the podcast. Freshbooks, thank you for advertising and, and thanks twit listener for using that special url freshbooks.com slash twit don't forget to put this week in tech in the how did you hear about us section thank you fresh books uh moving right along we were talking about coronavirus apple is reopening its stores but it's kind of a soft reopening temperature checks as people come in the door limited hours crowd control and they're only you know half the hours they're normally open it just doesn't sound like a very welcoming prospect. But no, all... and a Apple stores have one of the highest uh, like sales per square foot of, of stores in the world. And so if they're limiting hours, limiting people, I mean, this is real that's material gonna... revenue that's being lost. Cost them so... a lot of money. Uh, is, do you have any no, uh, word about whether this will slow down? They were, we expected, going to announce next month probably new iPhones and iPads. I don't see how they can do that now. Wow, I mean, I don't, I don't know. That's more of a, a Rubino question, I feel. But my mm. answer is, I hope so, because my iPhone Seven is finally dying, and I have to actually get a replacement eventually. So I feel like I need, I need to get excited about something. But uh, Daniel, what do you got? Yeah, I haven't really heard too much about new iPhones. I wouldn't be surprised though if they do some iPad refreshes. Uh, I, I, the iPhone, I expect maybe in the fall. And then there's going to be that question of, are they going to finally do 5G? Um, and there's been talks of a significant revision. I, I'm going to say, as someone who's actually been iffy on Apple for the last few years, the iPhone 11 has actually been a super impressive device. I've had Is that a hard what you time use? Giving it up. I, I did up until this week, which we can talk about this. Oh, uh, what are you bit, using now? Is, oh, man, oh. how did you get one of them? I'm so jealous. I ordered one That's from Best amazing. Buy. That's amazing. So I ordered yeah. one from Best Buy, too. That's the Z Flip. So yep. Samsung had its big unpacked event uh, on Tuesday. They announced four new phones, three new S20s. That's the designation for the Samsung Galaxy S phones for this year. The S20, S20 Plus, S20 Ultra, like 120 megahertz refresh, or hertz, not megahertz, yeah. 120 hertz refresh, um, 18 cameras or something, a giant camera bump. I mean, it's just crazy. But all of this looked like kind of, well, that's what I'd expect, the next generation Galaxy S. Then they announced the Z Flip, or as the rest of the world calls it, the Z Flip. That, to me, is the most interesting phone of the year. It really is. Um, so let me see it. You got it. You yeah, ordered it yeah. at Best Buy. Did you, go, did you get it Friday or... Yeah, so I, I was one of those uh, Thursday night at I midnight. Yes. I was, you know, yes. I, I ordered it within like five minutes. Me too. And then they're like, yeah, they're like, you'll get it Monday. And it actually showed <sighs> up Saturday. So I actually had a very so good bummed. Best Buy experience. Not you that I'm very sponsored lucky. by them. but I was um, going to go pick it up at the, my problem maybe is I said, oh, I'll get it at the Santa Rosa store. And you live in New York. I think. What, no, I'm in Massachusetts now. Oh, you're in Massachusetts. Okay. Yep. Um, I, I think what they said was uh, San Francisco, L.A., New York, New York, the big city, Atlanta. He had a, a few. Had, would have like five. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, <laughs> they're, so they're really they're sell sold out, out I mean, everywhere, but that's because they sold a hundred. Right, yeah, exactly. right, twenty exactly. phones so total. The, the <laughs> supply was super limited. I told you I'd go into San Francisco and stand uh, in line. I'm so for you, bummed Leo. out. Let me. Let me. <laughs> I'm gonna go look at my uh, order. I give it. I made a bookmark. This is how much I care. I made a bookmark on my on my web browser to check my Best Buy order. Oh, so what do you That's think, so Daniel? Impressive. Yeah, so oh, it, it's a it is the most intriguing piece of technology I've used since I yeah. drove my Tesla. Um, it is it's really got me to rethink technology in terms of phones, and it, it's not all perfect, right? Like if you 
opening and closing it is definitely an extra step. And if you're always putting your phone out of your pocket, there's that trade off. And that's real. It's also a little bit more delicate, or at least I'm treating it more delicate than I probably would, uh, you know, something like the S20 Ultra. Um, that said, the way like I have it right now with it sort of, you know, propped open like this. as like, I a love laptop. that little the little Barbie laptop. Yeah, I think that's and so great. I leave it on my desk like this, and, and it has the always-on display, so it just shows my calendar <sighs> and any notifications. And now I'm using it also with Microsoft's um, Your Phone because it's built into Samsung's phone. Right. So with Windows 10, I just launched a Your Phone app. I can now mirror the phone. I can actually just run the apps directly. I get notifications. I can make phone calls. I can do text messages all while it's open on my computer. And that's like – and it uses Wi-Fi Direct, basically, and it's actually a very fast connection. So it's really just sort of made me rethink about what a um, a smartphone can be. I don't think it's for everybody. It's still too early. You know, this question, like, is it worth it? You know, come on, it's $1,400. Most people, it's not going to be worth it. But um, it, it really is transformative. I hate to be cliche, but it, it really does sort of make you rethink uh you know, what phones and devices can be. And this idea that it's a large phone that folds up and, you know, and I close it here. And I just oh, it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, $1, Go ahead, pick it up, here. pick it up, pick it up. Is it okay? Oh, oh. little phone. Are you okay, little phone? No, I have a rug. It's all right. Uh, <laughs> oh, my God. And you and got the right color. Face. You got the purple. So yeah, do you yeah, see a color. crease? You see a little subtle crease where it bends? Yeah. So when you if you open it and you go into the light and you kind of reflect you have it, to, you have to do that, though. Yeah. But when you're it. using it, you absolutely do not see the okay. crease. You feel the crease. And that's weird. Um, it feels it felt at first to me like I had a uh, some gunk on the screen or something. But you get used to it. And since it's halfway up, you can actually scroll mostly in the bottom half of the screen. Oh, I see. I can see the crease when you hold it like that. I could totally. Yeah. See yeah. It. yeah. Yeah. There we go. You can it's not that get bad. Yeah. No, no. You expel. Look, it's folding. So. I think that th there's two ways to go with a folding phone: either unfold it to make it bigger, or f or start small and make yes. it normal phone size. And I think this is, a, unfortunately, the Moto Razor was announced two weeks ago, and yeah. uh, apparently isn't very good. It's crinkly and weird. Uh, Samsung comes along two weeks later and says, "Well, how about this?" They claim to be using very thin foldy glass. Yeah. Although Jerry Rig, <laughs> have you seen Jerry Rig yet? Because yeah. Jerry Rig everything. It kind of makes me mad because Jerry likes takes you know exacto knives and and pointy objects and tries to scrape the darn thing. Oh, that's just like a torture. I know. That's like saw for gadgets. I don't Crying like that at all. I can't even get one, and Jerry's already. Oh, oh, oh no! Take it off. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Salt. It's so, worse when he takes exacto knife to the metal on the side and starts scraping so it. So obviously like, no one's going to do that, but he is measuring the mo hardness, and he says. Yeah. It's a hardness of only two or three. It is not glass yep. hard. So what do you think? Yeah. His theory is I mean, it's not really glass. It's a polymer with glass particles plastic. embedded. It's glass-like. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We don't – who knows, right? I mean they're being coy on this. So let's just be honest. And like Samsung probably could have been – a lot of this is marketing. So the the – the issue is this. When you use it and you feel it and compare it to the Fold and the Razer phone, it feels way better. That's yeah. why everybody's so excited about it. It yeah. does feel smooth. It feels glass-like. And that's why people are, like, kind of believing it, you know. But when it comes to – it doesn't have the properties of glass in terms of resilience. And that's sort of the issue. Now, to Samsung's credit here, they're like – you can get a professionally installed screen protector on it, which they offer do. that at no charge. Yeah, you go to yeah. iFix, I can, you fix, I fix it, you fix it, yep. whatever it's called. I have and, you and fixed. <laughs> what is it called? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I didn't even know about it. No, no, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a phone repair company. I fix, you break, you break, I fix, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, the other thing is if, yeah, if you break the display, they'll replace it for a one time for $120, which is, yeah. which is, yeah, I mean, that's expensive, but for a $1,400 phone, that's like, okay, that's actually a pretty good thing. Uh, so I think we have to learn that if it's a foldable screen, you don't take an exacto knife to it. You, you know, <laughs> treat it with some, here he is though. I may have to say he's using his fingernail. Yeah. That's what I mean. Burning. He's creasing it with his fingernail. Yep. But oh, don't wow, do that. Brutal. Don't do that, yeah. folks. Just be very gentle with it. I do like the form factor. I think this is, and it, and it bodes well for Microsoft because they've got. Now they're doing two screens mm. with a hinge, the Neo and In the Duo. Glass. Yeah, yeah. But I think so that's where the good, benefit is. Yeah, you know. I think there's a good form. I love the little Smurf laptop form factor. I think that's yeah. Great. 
Is Apple you, doing anything like this? No, or is, is there no. ever going to be an Apple device that has a cool screen like this? Or are they going to fall behind in form factors and eventually get themselves in the back of the market here? They're going to do what they always do, which is they're going to <laughs> – them and their fans will continue to dismiss this as a gimmick, a fad. Until it's breakable. It's stupid. Everybody until wants Apple one. comes out and <laughs> does it. And to <laughs> Apple's credit, they'll probably come out and – do it right, as all Apple fans like to say. And I honestly I don't doubt it. that's how the company operates. Right. But they'll probably come out with a, you know, by that time that the actual material science, we're expecting Corning to actually have bendable, foldable glass by the end of this year. You know, Apple will do. I, I think everybody's going to do this or at least offer a version of it because I what see. you keep hearing people talk about is, you know, it's what Leo was saying. So this is a, a large phone that folds into a smaller one. The Galaxy Fold is a tablet that folds into the size of a right. phone. And, you know, it's I like this women. better. The, yeah, women yeah. put it in your purse. I could put it, you know, it's like a pocket square. You could put it yeah, in Yeah, it's really, it's really small. Yeah. And when I'm even at the gym, you know, it's nice not having a slab on my pant leg. You know, like you don't feel it as much. It's still <laughs> heavy. But it's a uh, stop it, Alex. You have a dirty mind. <laughs> he made well, a Daniel, joke. I laugh at it. It's not my fault. <laughs> it's his fault. You know, Daniel, those words. He said slab in his pants. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, now, now who's double clicking on my on my giggle, Leo? It's, it's you, sir. It's you. No, I agree. Daniel, I, I like the phone. idea of a smaller phone that gives you all the affordances of a larger phone and then some. I mean, I think Google knew that folding phones were coming. They adapted Android for foldables so that. Uh, a program like Google Duo can know that it's uh, half open and put the picture on the top, the controls on the bottom. I think there's. I hope we see more apps do that. I think that's yeah. a real. Are are do the, all the Samsung apps must be fold aware, right? Yeah, YouTube does it right now. Uh, Duo and there's a couple other apps. It's not a ton, but Samsung did say they're going to release in the API and work with Google and partners to sort of bring that feature. But yeah, that's what makes it. It's that feature that really kind of makes it one of the more interesting devices. But in terms of the experience of it, the cameras are very good. The battery life has been solid so far. It's not amazing battery life, but it, for most people in this demographic, I would say it's fine. It's an 855 uh, Snapdragon, so it's a it's yep. as fast as any of this year, or, you know, last year's flagships. Not as yep. fast as the S20 will be, but it's fine. Yeah, I mean, this is basically two th late 2019 flagship phone right. in terms of specs. Right. The cameras are great. Uh, it's wireless charging, 8 gigs of RAM. It comes with a little case in the box. I mean, it, it's a cool device. It's not perfect. You know, it's for early adopters, trendsetters, and that's the point of it, to get it out there. I, I've seen so many influencers and people in tech have it this weekend. And that's exactly kind of what Samsung <laughs> wanted, right? We're all right. talking about it. Yeah. But if you go read most of the – everybody's doing sort of – 24 hour, 48 hour reviews and updates. Everybody's pretty, you know, happy about it. Actually, I would wait been... though. If you're, sure. I mean, I'm going to buy it, but right away as you did. But I would wait a month or so before you, a, a normal person, spends fourteen hundred bucks on this because you oh, really yeah, do want to make sure it's going to be durable. We've had a bad experience already with the Galaxy Fold. You know, you Although might... the Galaxy Fold, to its credit, with that second version that came out, I know quite a few people who have it. And it's funny because you're not hearing Fold displays getting scratched, breaking, all that. Like, exactly. it, it, there, there's not – that's not out there right now. So right. they seem to have done a pretty solid job with this. Uh, but it, it's still too, too expensive for most people. Samsung has rewritten the bad branding that the Fold had last year. I mean, initially, and Daniel, to the, to your point uh, and the use of the word gimmick, that's all I thought about foldable phones right. uh, yeah. 12 months ago. And what they've done is not just say, hey, this isn't a gimmick. They put it into a product that you can use right now and get the same use that you would out of a traditional smartphone, uh, but in a non-gimmicky form factor. I yeah. think uh, maybe it's... The, the, the chat room saying, oh, you tech people, you just want something new to talk about. And that's fair. Uh, we have slab, glass slab phones. We've had to put up with them since <laughs> for the last 10 years. Uh, yes. It's nice to see some a different form factor. And for the first time, I think this is a form factor that might have some legs. We, It's not the first folding phone. I had a Moto Razor way back in the day, right? This one doesn't give you the satisfying hang-up, though, right, Daniel? You can't slap. Oh, you can. You can? Yeah, you can. Do. Oh. oh, yeah, it does that. Yep. Damn you! 
I mean, <laughs> yeah. what's really fun about this is so I, I got a work phone uh, when I went back to TechCrunch because it's part of the Verizon world. And so I got a, a Verizon work phone. So I have a newer iPhone with my old personal iPhone. And I was shocked at how within five minutes I was bored of it. Like, there was nothing there that got me excited. Yeah, there was yeah. no new experiences, no new apps. It was it was a little bit smaller, it's a little bit faster. And it had Face ID. It's incremental. This, and you'll feel the same way when you go to the set from the 7 to the 11. It's an yeah. incremental upgrade. It's not, you know, ooh. But a second screen, apps that work with my computer, you know, always on displays. These are things that are actually different. They could change my workflow. And that's exciting to me. Because I'm it very has excited about the Duo and the Neo, Microsoft's end of year products. I think there's one Android, one um, Windows. I think they're mm -hmm. going to be very interesting. Microsoft this week uh, at the developer conference uh, allowed people to start playing with, what is this new version of Windows called? Uh, Windows 10 10X. X. X. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what's what's different, Daniel? What is 10x? So 10x is a really interesting thing. We've been covering it for the last almost like I think three years. It's based off of a thing called Windows Core OS. So the core of this is still Windows. It's also Azure. This is why the core of Windows is under the Azure group now. But the shell is unique and different and new. It's sort of an amalgamation between Windows Desktop and Windows Mobile, although Microsoft won't say that because you know Windows Mobile has a uh, pretty bad reputation at this point. But what it is, it's a um, it kind of looks like Windows 10 desktop as you know it, but it has, they removed all the Win32 legacy components from it. That is, all the stuff that's built on classic Windows that runs on your desktop is both its strength and its weakness. It's been around. Some of those components in Windows 10 that you're using right now on your desktop is 20 years old. You know, yeah. there's like fax machine and mm -hmm. stuff. So what they did was all that stuff is gone. It's just core Windows and then this new shell experience on top that's built around dual experience devices. Although later on, we, we definitely expect this. It does run on single screen. So we know their long-term plans is to get this an so ultra So initially it's for the Duo or the Neo rather. It's uh, right. initially planned for a two-screen device. But, you know, what Microsoft has needed to kind of get the cruft out for a yeah. long time. And I think really one of the reasons the Neo exists is not because Microsoft thinks that the future of all computers is dual screen, but because they wanted something so different and new that they could create, you know, kind of, okay, but we're going to make a version of Windows for that. Yeah. That is, because one of the problems Microsoft has is all of the people running old PCs that need to run their line of business software on old versions of Windows. Legacy has been handcuffing Microsoft for sure. decades. So having a new device and they can say, well, understand, we're going to leave Legacy out here. We're going to create something uh, unique. Oh. They've also con they're also containerizing uh, Win32. Win32. In other words, they're separating it away from... So if there are problems or security issues or crash issues, it's kind of in its own little container away from the rest of the operating system. Is that yep, right? Yeah, they're getting the best of both worlds here. So you're going to get this new UI, this new experience. It's it's literally, I mean, it was rumored to be called Windows Lite, and that's because that's a, you, know, you can think of it that way. It's it's physically a lighter operating system. But that's a bad faster. name because it implies it's, it's going to be kind of It does of have like, the functionality. Yeah. Right? So that's why it's called Windows 10 So it'll but, run 64-bit so, apps. Yes, Will they mm. run it in container as well? Yes. Everything. Everything. Uh, does. The only thing that runs native is UWP, the Universal Windows Platform. Those run native, still containerized, but that's how UWP runs anyway. Win32, including x86, 32-bit, and 64-bit apps, run as a single container. It's an abstracted way. It's a subsystem of the operating system, which means when you're not using it, it doesn't use any resources, which is the benefit here. So they get uh, a tight security model for the operating system. It's not slowed down by having legacy Win32 components running in the background like system tray. But when you need to run yet that app, you just launch it and it just boop, will show up. And it be it actually is launching a, uh, a version of Windows 10, the actual Windows 10 operating system, but without all the, the unnecessary fluff and uh, UI. And it runs the app. And the app does everything you expect it to. If you open up a file, you want to save a file, those directories, directories will exist. And so it it you get everything. So if you want to run those apps, you can do it. And then if you minimize that Win32 app, it's going to basically suspend in the background. So again, what this is prioritizing is performance, battery life, and things for that's important to mobile. And this is what's always been hampering mobile devices with Microsoft, is when you run Win32 stuff, it it's bad for battery. UWP is very good for battery, but 
it's it does it's not the app solution for everybody. Sometimes you want to run that Photoshop app, right? Um, so this kind of solves all those problems. And the emulator release this week is a, a opportunity for developers to actually try it out and see what runs and what doesn't. It's interesting um, oh, for so many reasons. It's interesting. The apps will run full screen, but I think that's intended for the Neo. If you were running on a big screen desktop, it might not. But uh, but the apps run full screen, kind of like tablet mode. Yeah, that's a, and it was funny because uh, when I I interviewed some people at Microsoft about this, and I asked them uh, about that topic, and there's a lot of internal debate even within Microsoft about is that the right approach. The theory is if you're on a small screen device, and the Neo is basically two nine inch device, two nine inch screens that span out to about thirteen inches. Uh, when you're on a device like that. Having multi windows, like five windows on a single pane, is probably not something most people are going to do. They're going to operate it with, you know, full screen. But yeah, if you go to a larger screen device, you'd want that freedom. But they're not locked into either one. That's one reason why they're giving it to developers. And if they hear developers go, listen, even on small devices, we want to have multiple windows and window, uh, you know, side by side kind of things, they, they're open to allowing that to happen. I've, you know, I wonder what you guys think. I have kind of come around to the full screen app even on my mac now i will full mm -hmm. screen everything and sw and swipe between separate desktops i think this idea of having a lot of little windows doing different things is not really how the mind works we it are was never good we don't multitask we time we, we we time slice and so it makes more sense to have one task full screen in front of you and then swipe it out of the way to do another thing so there's occasionally you want side by side and that's what a tool dual screen device is a very interesting uh, device because you can have controls on one side and the uh, objects you're operating on on the other side or something like that um, I'm more and more convinced that full screen isn't a bad way it is a very good way to operate I don't maybe it's just me yeah I, I agree with that but once again I'm on Twit and we're talking about a couple of different companies a couple of different platforms a couple of different devices and we're talking about Apple being a bit boring and everyone else being kind of cool and it's just such a hilarious inversion from where we were four years ago yeah. five years ago yeah I, I'm, I'm blown away like I mean that's I called to success Daniel. Alex <laughs> True, but I just listened to Daniel talk about developer things for like five minutes, and I was actually interested in it. Like that's how cool yeah. this is. Like, like it's it's evidence that what's being built is in fact different and exciting, and, and maybe opening up new doors for us to do cool things. Uh, and whereas my new iPhone 11 that I got from work is just the, I fell asleep. Well, oh, taking it out of the box. So do, it, it's fun. I'm excited about the future. We do have to um, remember that the human brain is tuned to change. We we we're you know if there's a tiger stalking us we don't want to see the landscape unchanging landscape we want to see what's different it's the tiger and our brain really embraces change and newness and prefers it to the same old same old that's kind of a classic human problem and it's a big problem for tech reporters because we're always going what's the next new thing what's the next new thing instead of yeah. saying hey this thing is perfect this is doing exactly what it should do so i i just want to say i'm going to try to not be too enamored of the new just for news in this sake but it does seem to me that windows needed this refresh and now i asked we spent a lot of time on windows weekly talking about virtual machines versus containers and i'm sure daniel you're up on this so correct me if i'm wrong but a virtual machine is heavyweight because it contains the entire operating system it's basically everything running in, in a separate little window Whereas yeah. a container, the operating system is a, is a single core operating system that all the containers share, but the containers still are somewhat isolated. So you get right. some of the benefits of virtualization without the heavyweight extra, you know, multiple yeah. operating systems. Yeah, so you'll be able to, like I said, run the 32-bit and 64-bit classic apps, and they behave. They're supposed to behave as expected. The the difference is, like for instance, if you have an app that runs at startup and then it goes and pops at a system tray, that doesn't work on Windows 10X because because there's no system tray anymore because that's a legacy Win32 thing. Uh, yeah. So what happened? <laughs> but what happens is though they built it so when it does those API and registry calls. The OS basically hears them, but sort of ignores them. In other words, the app shouldn't crash or shouldn't be unusable because of that. You'll still be able to run the app. It just means some of these classic so apps. So there's no backgrounding? There's no... 
Not right now, but even there, they're flexible on. So right now, Win32 uh, apps on Windows 10X, if you minimize them or you close it, of course, it's going to suspend all those processes and gives all the resources back to the operating system. If you bring that window back up for Win32, the system resources will focus on that because that's what you're using. So that's where you get the smart stuff. But they are open to the idea of giving basically users a switch, a toggle that would allow this, knowing the fact that you're going to take a hit now on performance and battery life. But again, they're open to that idea. But I think for the you know consumer experience, they prefer not to happen. And it, that raises a question, what classic app do you need to be running on something like the Surface Neo that needs to be running in the background as your mobile, right? So th that's where this isn't like a desktop operating system. That's where sort of the how hard, thinking is. How hard is this going to be for developers to get their head around? Is this a hard thing, a new way, a new paradigm? Or is it that's what's cool about it is right now the default experience on 10x is if you launch an app it just takes up a single one of the screens and then if you want you can drag it over into the middle and then it'll go to both screens and span and you'll you'll get that so there's technically not a lot like even if you have a classic app companies don't need to go redo anything for their app what microsoft's done with this emulator and the sdk for it is basically said if you want to leverage the dual screen stuff and they fully admit not all apps are going to be able to benefit from this right it doesn't make sense but if you have something like outlook where you can have you know the email list on one side and then on the other side you have the email and you can use those independently or if you're on the mm. skype call and you open up OneNote and you can follow a presentation or a powerpoint you, you know, this is where it starts to make sense where you can have apps span across and do these dual things. So that's what's neat about it is you don't need to developers don't have to actually do anything a lot of times to just have the app run. It will by default. And this goes for the duo, too, for Android. Um, but they want developers to sort of think about how they could utilize this opportunity here if they so choose to as an experience on this device. Uh, and how about users? Is this going to be, you know, intuitive for users? Are they going to say, oh, yeah, I get what's going on? I think if you have a two-screen device, it will be. In fact, I think users are going to like it. Yeah, when you look at the um, – and Zach Bowden, our senior writer, did a, a walkthrough video. It's 20 minutes. Basically. Yeah, I'm watching you can it see right the now. whole. Yeah. yeah, you can see yeah. it all in action. It's a very – it's it's like if you combine uh, iPad OS with the power of Windows. Right. And what's neat about it is it's not a it's not a Windows version of iPad OS because you still get to run all your legacy applications. But you really need to think about it this way. Windows 10 desktop is Win32 first and UWP second, right? You can run UWP apps on there right. if you want to. But UWP most of are those store apps, basically. The store apps, right. Yeah. This is reversed. This is Windows 10X is UWP first but Windows 32 still runs on there, and you still get near-native performance as well. So but you get this legacy, is but you get legacy kind of in a protected mode so that it can't yes. screw you up. Win32 yeah. has historically been the biggest problem <laughs> on Windows. It, it actually solves the virus problem. In, in theory, you don't need to even run antivirus on this because of the way it's containerized. The Win32, if you installed an executable that was a virus, cannot infect the operating system because it's siloed off. So because of that, again, returns to performance of the operating system better for mobile. So it's a, it's a really kind of neat idea. It's, they've been working on this for a very long time. It's yeah. required ridiculous amounts of engineering, but it's a modular operating system. So they could actually, you know, some of this, part of this runs on HoloLens 2. They could yeah. take out the Win32 subsystem and make a phone if they wanted to. That was the original was, plan for Surface Duo. Uh, but they switched it to Android because the app problem still right. exists. What if they actually built phone into this and just didn't call it Windows Phone? Just to <laughs> avoid the whole Microsoft yeah. phone, you know, historical fiasco. It is a they phone. Kinda... They said, don't call it a phone, but it's running Android and you can make calls with it. That's a yeah, phone. No, well, it Panos feels Peter, like a phone. He never said it's not a phone. He just said it, it's a phone, but it's more than that. Okay. And so he's just making the, that's just a marketing thing. They're just making a distinction to separate themselves right. from the market. Well, they don't, and, and Windows Alex, Phone has such a bad reputation. They didn't. Yeah, they never Alex wanted point, to make a they, Surface Phone again. Yeah, they, they could have. And that's what the Duo was going to be. It was going to be Windows 10X. It was going right. to be a phone. But they knew they want it to succeed, right? They right. want people to buy this. And the app problem, no matter how much diehard Windows fans want that thing, it would not succeed because you, you still need Snapchat. You need Gmail. Right. You need like all these core apps. And without that, it wouldn't succeed. No. But they, they could, you know, like five years from now, if this app story changes, whether it's PWAs or UWP takes off, you know, which probably won't happen, but could. They could easily put telephony into the system and just make a phone. They could do that if they want to. It's easy. I will buy that. 
I will buy that because I want I want there to be another uh, member of the the mobile yeah, OS world. I'm that. so bored yeah. with with what sure. we have. It's not I just know, boredom. You know, we need the competition, frankly. Right. That'll spur it forward. But I mean, Leo, your point about not just going after the new thing because it's new is it, totally valid. And technology should work better than it does. And a lot of new stuff doesn't work that well, including software. But uh, after 10 years of this kind of one form factor for mobile phones, I, I, I'm stoked beyond belief that we're finally going to break out of this box and do some new things. If it's the flip phone, if it's dual screen machines, if it's a weird hybrid OS that brings I, you know, iPad OS equivalents and Windows together, whatever it is, I'm ready to have new stuff because I'm drowning. Yeah. I have so you're much like, going you're, on. You're basically like Peggy Lee. <laughs> Uh, None of us get that. <laughs> yeah. Is that all there is? Is that all there is? Is that all uh, there is to Alex, phones? Alex does not know who Peggy Lee is. I, know I do I know who Peggy Lee is. I just Who's do that Peggy to Lee? him to make him feel young. I mean, I'm getting old, but I still don't know your references. I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> Daniel, <laughs> Daniel, is there any purpose or would there be any purpose to boot camp this even just or is it possible to boot camp this even? You want just to put to, it on your Mac, to, huh? I, yeah, abs I mean, as he's talking, as Daniel's explaining this, I'm like, how can I extract myself from Mac OS and iOS and fully move over to Windows? I mean, this sounds like what Alex is talking about, real innovation, not innovation as a gimmick, but gimmick uh, uh, innovation that will well, push productivity in the consumer experience. And even forward. more than that, Microsoft's been pushed into this because Windows is such a nightmare. Yeah. Windows 10 especially is a nightmare. They just put out... A, an update that breaks people's windows <laughs> and people yeah. are rolling back because they can't trust the updates. Microsoft, ha it's not, it, it's innovation because we need to innovate, but also because we're desperate because we have a problem here. This is legacy. This cold code is so old and so mm -hmm. messed up and so spaghettied. They got to clean it up. Please, right. people, though, do not uh, try to roll back to Windows 7 because that's broken, too. Don't right do that. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's all really, th th I mean, that's the funny thing. It's still Windows 7. That's the problem. It's this sure. code base, this old code base. They're just tacking stuff onto. That's why 10X is, mar is more interesting. I, they didn't start from the ground up, though, either. Uh, well, 10X is from the ground up. It basically. is. I mean, the, the okay. entire shell is completely new. So everything about Ooh. it is built. Like it's going to be a very consistent UI in terms of the operating system. If you're running Win32 apps, that's you're going to get a contrast. To to get back to Dan's question, um, as of right now, so there are people who are actually booting this onto a MacBook. Here it is. Has, this is the tweet. This is from yeah. uh, Sunshine Biscuit at Scale. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. So you know it's it's good. You're, so you're, the problem, it's very risky. You're, you're injecting drivers. Yeah. It's not something you can like roll back. And, you know, it. you don't probably want to do this right now. But there there are some people putting guides out there. It does work. Uh, someone's also done it on Surface Go and a Dell XPS 13. And it goes to show you that this is fully operational as a standard laptop operating system because that's what Microsoft's long term plan is. Yeah. But you know, what Leo was saying, they're doing this on dual screens to basically raise interest and hype and interest yeah. and also so it doesn't scare off doesn't Windows 10 like scare legacy people. User. That's the key. Yeah. yeah. So, but long term, yeah, this is, you know, I would you don't want to see, Microsoft doesn't want to see announcement. There's a new operating system from Microsoft. That's right, the worst right. thing. Uh, they don't want to, they don't want to scare people that way. Yeah. Because an IT department is going to be like, wait, what do I know? Right. I know about this. So it's like new device experiences is how they're going to do it. Right. That said, obviously, this is an emulator people are putting onto Macs. Um, there's no ISO yet. Uh, we don't know Microsoft's plans. There's, I can tell you there's no plan in place for people to upgrade Windows 10 desktop to Windows 10X. It, it's probably not going to be able to be done because it's a completely different system. But uh, as we get further along, you know, who knows how the story may change. And yeah, maybe we'll see a boot camp version of this happen. Um, but, you know, make no mistake, this is the version of Windows that Microsoft sees most people going to in the next, I would say, five to 10 years. This is the real future forward looking version okay. of Windows. Desktop, classic Windows will always exist. It'll be there for people who need it. But increasingly, um, you know, what this allows them to do is create new hardware that they couldn't do before, including dual screen devices and things that use small processors that aren't always Intel based. This one is Intel based for now, but we've seen it with ARM and AMD. So it allows them to create new experiences where they were hampered before with classic Windows. That's really the purpose here. You really wonder... Uh I got my Apple has to have some sort of skunk works where they're saying, well, what's what's next? I mean, we've we've labored 
really there are only three operating systems for desktops and we've just kind of nothing's changed over the decade google has been working on fuchsia we've talked about that right. before and i think somewhat of a defensive um, maneuver uh, because android is under assault from oracle and you know that's going to go to the supreme court um, they did file a trademark for a new operating system i don't know how serious they are the name is pigweed <laughs> I didn't even get to see this. <laughs> I, I I missed this apparently. What yeah. what is pigweed, Leo? Uh, well, it uh, is a metaphor. I don't know. It's a <laughs> uh, Google's filed a trademark application for the name pigweed. The application says it will cover computer operating software. That's the only detail. I don't know if th <laughs> they're going to change the name from fuchsia to pigweed. Pigweed mm. is botanical. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's a plant. Uh, pigweed, uh, according to the Brooklyn Botanical Garden, just around the road, a piece from you there, Dan, uh, are otherwise known as amaranth. You know amaranth. It's a leafy plant that is edible, nutritious, and some pigweeds, when fully grown, will dry out and form tumbleweeds. So I think we now know what Google's up to. <laughs> not smokable, though. Do not smoke the pigweeds. Yes. <laughs> Although know. amaranth is also the name of a uh, European um, symphonic metal band. So if you wanted a little mm -hmm. nice musical mm -hmm. tie-in there, there uh -huh. you go. I rest my case. Yes. So is pigweed. <laughs> if it's not, it ought to be. All right, let's take let's take a little break. Uh, this is good. You guys are so good. I just, we should just keep this show going for hours and hours and hours. You don't need to eat, do you? Um, I fast. So. <laughs> Daniel Rubino, we'll he's intermittent fasting as we yeah. speak. Executive editor, Windows Central. It's great to have you on, uh, Daniel. Dan Patterson. From uh, CNET, CBS Interactive, and CBS News, always a pleasure. Senior producer over there covering, and it's turned dark in Brooklyn. The lights are out. Uh, sun, sun has gone down. And uh, from my childhood home in beautiful yes. Providence, Rhode Island, not merely the city, but the actual house, Alex <laughs> Wilhelm, reporter at TechCrunch. It's a long, long story, but he is living in the home that I grew up in. In Providence, he's actually my son. We can we can tell. It's true. It's, it's a long running it. secret and gag on the show. Might as well just. Everybody knows now. What is there to hide? Our show. We're going to St. Louis next month. I'm excited about this. We're going to do an event for worldwide technology. You know, if you're an enterprise, you know WWT. Uh, and do you know the ATC Worldwide Technology is Advanced Technology Center? That is pretty amazing. They started building it 10 years ago. I think, you know, there used to be, we used to have in Foster City, Ziff Davis Labs, this amazing testing facility. And I, now that the, the, there's no longer a Ziff Davis Labs, I'm thrilled that WWT has taken the mantle and built their advanced technology center. More than half a billion dollars in enterprise equipment there from hundreds of OEMs. Key partners ranging from heavyweights like Dell EMC, and VMware and Intel, emerging disruptors too, like Equinix. Why do they build this? Well, WWT's engineers use these environments to spin up proofs of concept and pilots. They use the lab environment so that when you come in as a customer and say, well, I've got, you know, I'm running, you know, EMC uh, storage and I, I use VMware, they can, they can combine, you know, VX rail, combine it all together in a way that uh, you, they can show you, yes, this is going to work well with this. This is what you need to do. Uh, but what they also do, which is amazing, is they offer lab as a service, a dedicated lab space within the Advanced Technology Center where you as a customer can perform your own programmatic testing. And you don't have to come to St. Louis. You can do it 24-7 from anywhere in the world. On-demand and schedulable labs uh, Dell EMC VX Rail, you've got Data Protection Central, you've got IDPA. All of the stuff in primary storage you might want to look at or be thinking about, you can try. Uh, there are hundreds of labs to explore. Multi-cloud, hyper-converged infrastructure, networking, secondary storage, data analytics, AI. It's all in the Advanced Technology Center 24-7. And it's available to you. They've launched this digital platform. The entire ecosystem is at your disposal. And you really get a multiplier effect here of knowledge, of speed, of agility, anytime, anywhere around the world for customers and partners. You'll get full access to everything, not just hands-on lab, but articles and case studies and all the tools you need to really make a difference in today's fast-paced world. WWT. 
Just go to www.com slash twit. Become a member of their growing community. Create an account. Get access to these on-demand labs at the ATC. And if you're in St. Louis, March 5th, we will see you out there. We'll announce. I, we're going to have a, a meetup. We'll go to Steak and Shake or something and <laughs> get together. It might be a breakfast meetup, so I don't know. But we're going to figure that out. And uh, if you are a WWT customer, you know, sign up for the uh, panel that we're putting together. It's going to be really interesting. Mary Jo Foley's coming out uh, for it. Um, uh, we're also going to get Alex Lindsay out there because he has a lot of experience operating streaming in the cloud. Uh, Mike Dorosh from Gartner. It's going to be a great panel. WWT March 5th. Ask him about it. WWT.com slash twit. Worldwide technology delivering business and technology outcomes around the world. <sighs> that was a very heavy conversation about Windows 10X, but I think it's really kind of exciting. Yes. To, to think about it. Now, when you, it's just an emulator at this point, Daniel, or can you? Yes. It isn't the actual. Well, it's an emulator, system. but people are hacking it onto their computers okay. to use as an just, operating system. Just I mean, that's clear. that's the internet for you. Yeah. But uh, expect Neo. You know, more information in September, October. Uh, Microsoft always has their Surface events then, right. uh, and we'll we'll get more. There'll be more build to about it. And don't forget, this isn't just for Neo. That's the flagship device. But Lenovo has the X1 Fold. Uh, their ThinkPad Fold coming out. It's going to run Windows 10 at first, but they'll have a version of Windows 10X later. Uh, Dell will have a foldable. Asus, I think, will have a foldable. HP will, too. So this is a big thing. So it's not just for that. But, uh, yeah, expect it by end of year. Duo, the Android phone, and I don't want to get too much hope up for this, but we are hearing that that may come out earlier than uh, fall or holiday season really? 2020. Yeah, so, you know, and this is driving out. me crazy. I just bought the Z Flip. Yeah. I had to buy the <laughs> S20 for Jason Howell so he can cover it on all about Android. All yeah. the phone companies now have decided once a year is not enough. Apple, Samsung, and Google all have mid year uh, refreshes. Apple's going to have new yeah. phones, Google's going to have the 4A. And then in the fall, we got a whole new thing from Microsoft. Yep. <sighs> so the Duo. Uh, you know, it's in testing right now. It's it's so there's different levels of testing. Have you Microsoft. seen it? Uh, oh, I, I've held it. So at the October event. Yeah. But there was um a, a it was about two weeks ago. There was someone up in I believe this is Vancouver was in public using it. So what's oh, happened is I did I saw that video. He was like in a subway. Yeah. Or a, a so bus they're allowing the employees yeah. to take it home and use it publicly, and that that tells you they're more at an advanced stage. Yeah, for you could testing. tell in this Twitter video that the employee knew he was being watched. Because yeah. he like he's he's playing with it. He's like showing stuff. Yeah. He's but he's not actively showing it to anybody, but he knows somebody's recording this. So they're clearly, yep. Yep. you know, okay, yeah. you can see it. They're allowed to be caught with it in public. They're not supposed to give interviews with it or anything right. like that. But if you're seen, he's with pretty it. proud so, of it, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so we 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 may hear more about it at build, um, but they you know presumably may want to get it to, into developer hands at some point. Now pricing will be interesting. Uh, it, it can obviously vary between the RAM and storage configurations, but being dual screen, I've been told by OEMs off the record when I've interviewed them that, um, you know, dual screen is cheaper and easier to do than a folding display. Right. Okay. And so, you know, I folding, know the, all the folding models are premium. I mean, they're, yeah, the, the, the so, Galaxy Fold's 2000. This is 1400. Yeah. So for the Galaxy Flip. So I wouldn't. Uh, between a thousand and fifteen hundred, depending on configuration, I think is reasonable. Um, but we have to kind of wait and see, you know, what what it's going to be. But it's a very when closed, the duo is as thin as the iPhone. That's why I think people don't understand how thin the technology is. It, it does have the world's thinnest LCD displays, oh, or there see, could be I OLED. But want that. It's very thin. So when you open oh, it up, it, it's sturdy. it's crazy to hold. Yeah. Um, it's it's hard to – and it looks bigger in this video. I, I know a lot of people will see this, and I think it's because her hands are oh, smaller. Oh, it goes all the way around too. Yeah, so you can use it as a single screen device. But when I got to hold it and see it and play with it, I was just like, this is way smaller. Oh, yeah, she's than only like three foot tall. She's got little yeah, tiny hands. Uh, yeah. But it, it's a pretty – like. It feels it feels amazing to hold and use. I'll just say that it's thin. It's like it's like the it's about as wide as a passport, but a little bit taller. It seems like phones are getting more and more expensive. It makes. I wrote sense. an article two years ago saying thousand dollar phones were coming, and people were like, "Oh, you're Nonsense. crazy, Daniel! Happen. You're crazy!" And I was just, and I was wrong because <laughs> not only did thousand dollar phones come, but two thousand dollars 2000. within like a year after that. So, um, yeah, That's we're crazy. we're in a new era, you know. 
It's okay. Really I don't crazy. think it's crazy though, because Leo, think about it this way: you spend how much money on your car? No, it's right? my you're, main you're, computer. Really, right, I exactly. use it more than any other computer I own. Exactly. And if something and that's why like it's okay. Dex, I mean, one of the coolest products Samsung makes that like almost Dex? nobody talks about is yeah. Dex. I do because I can take this hyper powerful supercomputer that I walk around with and plug it, like just put it in a dock, and suddenly this is as powerful as as my desktop, at least for the functions that most consumers Samsung need. Samsung announced that a few a few phones ago, and they continue to update it, and now it's got it's better and better. I have Dex running here on the Windows machine. Um, but it hasn't doesn't seem to gain a lot of traction. The idea oh, is yeah. that you have so much power now in this little thing in your pocket. What do you need a desktop for or a laptop? Just plug it into a keyboard, mouse, and monitor, and and it's your computer. And now all your data is on the phone, where it's probably safer, uh, and you and you always have it with you. Has it? But do you see people using Dex no, besides you? Never. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's cr it's great, but it's aspirational, and it's I I mean it shows us a future that much like uh, Daniel just detailed with Windows, is is a potential, uh, whether we get to there or not, who knows. But yeah. this is something that, uh, I mean, it really, for most consumers, you don't do heavy media processing or editing. The spreadsheets you use are fairly functional. Uh, with well, the, the and you have the cloud now, phone. right? This is yeah, what Microsoft's been very right. smart about. In fact, uh, they're talking about the edge all the time now, edge devices yeah. and, and Windows Edge. And and, they, and I think really what my, I mean, if you, it, from a 30,000 foot level, what Microsoft's really done is said, our business is no longer desktop software. Our business yep. is the cloud. And yeah. we're going to see Windows not yep. as our bread and butter anymore, but as a tool that that lets you use our real business, Azure, from the edge. Yes. They did the same thing with Xbox, right? The next Xbox is just going to be a piece of hardware that accesses Azure. Right. That's the xCloud streaming yeah. uh, gaming, which is coming soon. Google's tried to do something like that with Stadia. To I don't think they've made it. I have, I have a friend who plays with Stadia, and they, he raves about it. And so I'm tempted to give it a try. Um, but I, I think we can try it, and I do not rave. You're the. It. But see, there are very few. I mean, if you you if you're a console gamer, you don't need it. If you're a PC yeah, well, GeForce gamer, GeForce Now need it. is great. GeForce Now lets you take the games yeah. you already own, and I mean stream. Stadia's. Stadia's business is clearly white label, right? Creating a product for, uh, say, Blizzard or, oh. uh, or oh. yeah, if, any yeah, so any Blizzard of the game just pulled all their stuff off of GeForce now. GeForce yeah, now. I mean, like yeah. I'd be sh shocked if Stadia's actual business is for consumers. It's that really a B two B product uh, that allows. But that's big kind game of what Microsoft's doing. Label. They're offering right. cloud services. I mean, Sony's cloud is. I mean, Sony, who is Microsoft's main competitor in gaming their, hardware, their cloud is now Azure. Is, their cloud is Azure. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. It's very yeah. interesting. Microsoft doesn't care. They'll sell to anybody. Right. It, yeah, and the exactly. term for this, by the way, is it's going to be, it's it's two. There's ambient computing and what's yeah. also called ubiquitous yeah. computing. Yep. This idea uh -huh. that we're eventually we'll just have uh, displays around us that are empty shells, but you connect up to a cloud and run the operating system that way. So every time and I that, tell people about this, they say, well, we already, we had that. We don't like it. That's what we had. When we had the client server. Yeah. We had the big computer and then you had a little thin client and you were doing, we didn't, we, that and then we got back a, when broad, when broadband was not available. Wait, but, yeah. But you yeah. had a fast connection cause no. you had a T1 no. line or whatever, but now we, then we got freedom. We have our own C, one desk, one CPU. That's, that's what we fought for <laughs> in yeah. the, yes, in the famous server wars of eight, 1982. My but, CPU will not run run high end games, oh, um, and, and I'm not and I'm not going to pay. <laughs> you need a better CPU. I'm not going to pay five thousand dollars every <laughs> right. two years to run games. I will pay. So what is the difference between the I, old days and today? What what has happened? Well, five the promise of five G. That's where it comes in. High speed right? internet. Like, yeah. And and the yeah. cloud. I mean, the cloud is the the one technology that is everything yeah. else. Right, five G, IoT, Edge. All of these things are hyper serving of the cloud. And look at the battle that's going on. This the joint the Jedi project, which is a ten billion dollar oh, yeah. Pentagon oh, contract to run the next generation of Pentagon cloud, which meant you know it has to be secure. It has. To, I mean, there's a lot of requirements the Pentagon had. Oh yeah. They bid it out. Google was involved, but the, their engineers said, yeah, we don't want to work on a defense project. So Google bowed out. Then it was down to Microsoft and Amazon. Uh, 
Microsoft won it, to the surprise of a lot of people who thought Amazon was for sure, AWS is the obvious choice. Microsoft won it. There was some thinking. Amazon said, wait a minute, this is because President Trump hates Jeff Bezos. And we bet he th he th put his fingers in the in the works and threw it to Microsoft. They sued, and a judge on Thursday said, oh, hold on a minute. Microsoft did not win this contract. He put a temporary restraining order, an injunction, and said, we yeah. got to look into this. That is how important these businesses are now. $10 billion over 10 years. And it's yeah, more than that, right? Because that's a foot in the door. It's $10 billion, but the it's guaranteed service and larger contracts after that. Yeah, so. you, you become the Pentagon's main cloud provider. Right. Whoever this wins this, that's big. This goes back to the top of the show, and Leo was talking about what we talk about on Twitter over time. And now people say, don't bring up politics. Leave it alone. How do you not? Here we are yet again. Yeah. You know, yeah. how yeah. do you not? Tech Tech is not a vertical. It is a horizontal, and it's woven through everything that we do. Woo. Love it or lump it. It's a yeah. horizontal. That's a new one. I've never heard well, that phrase before. Look at this. <laughs> look at this. Well, yes, you have. You've got vertical I, I, markets. What's the opposite of a vertical market? To be clear, I've heard about horizontal integration. A mattress? But a horizontal. No, that Casper Republican, that was terrible. I just like the way Dan <laughs> phrased it, Leo. Jeez. Okay, I'll tell you how. I'll tell you how much tech has invaded the real world. The Oscars, Sunday night. Taika Watiti wins an Oscar for best screenplay. Oh, yeah. Goes backstage at the press <laughs> conference. They say, Taika, you just won the Academy Award. What are you doing? Now, most of the time, people would say, I'm going to Disneyland. Instead, he says... Apple's got to fix their MacBook keyboard. <laughs> They're impossible to write on. They're getting worse. It makes me want to go back to PCs. He even complained he's got RSI from the darn thing. It's the I first mean, time I've seen one of these award shows actually have a good news item that I cared about. Isn't uh, that hysterical? Yeah. I like I was this dying. guy before <laughs> this, wrong. you know, because first of all, I, I think his movies are absolutely fantastic. Jojo Rabbit uh, is deserve. I was really disappointed. It's so def Parasite it's so should not have won. Jojo Rabbit is an amazing movie, but I yeah. think any movie that has Hitler prancing around. <laughs> yeah, that was a little awkward. People are yeah, it's a little awkward. People are going. I love the little kids. They were just the. Oh, the I kids was just, were great. I almost got diabetes. It was so sweet. Oh, but it was <laughs> so sweet. <laughs> Uh, but I, I like it. And he did Thor Ragnarok, which was one of the funniest films. The I've only ever seen. good Thor. Yeah, oh, yeah whoa, absolutely. Whoa. So this guy, like, <laughs> you know, I, I think his humanity is strong, his empathy. Like, it, it, he's just really good. But this had me cracking up. Obviously, I'm a little biased towards PC, but, uh, you know, I thought it was, uh, it was a pretty good shot. Tim right? Cook's got to be cringing. I don't know if yeah. Apple went to the Oscars. But here you have an Oscar winner going backstage. And the first thing he says, mm -hmm. make decent keyboards, Apple. You know, on the one hand, it's good for <laughs> Apple because he says, I want to use a Mac, right? Yeah, he. I mean, that's a funny thing, right? This is the classic Apple thing, which is you, you complain about it and you're mad and then you still will buy the next Mac, right? So like, You're giving me you know, RSI, but I still want to use you. I mean, we went through, what, three, four years of those butterfly switches and people, you know, like oh, getting God. really mad, but people just get buying them. Oh, like, not, yeah. I have spent hundreds on mechanical keyboards since then. Yeah. I mean, hundreds. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, all, all four of us type a lot. Yeah. Yes. Anybody who uses yeah. computers types a lot. You guys write, so you type more than the average bear. And I, I don't know how you do it on a Mac. On any of those well, you get one of these, Leo. You, get you have an external keyboard. Yeah. yeah, so this but is even that's this crazy. an amazing that looks, keyboard. That looks, that looks, that's, yeah, this is what you got to have. You got to have the Microsoft Ergo keyboard. No, that's, that's crap. Oh, put oh, that really? away. Look I'm not that. 85 years old. It makes me <laughs> nauseous just looking at it. It's like I have yeah, not seen one of those in years. It's bent. That's a brand new one. Get a code keyboard from WASM. It's I used got to have that. Cherry switches. It's got it. Uh, big yeah. travel. It it feels good when you type on it. I have them everywhere. I, okay, so I run a full size uh, mechanical gaming keyboard with Windows 10, and I love that. I love the sounds. I love the typing. But I will say that little Mac um, external that I just held up is probably the thing I'm fastest on in the world yeah, that any keyboard yeah. ever used. Yep. And to me, yep. that is a feat. And so if Apple could just kind of take that and put it into my MacBook Pro, I would give them more money. That doesn't really have uh, much key travel, though, that keyboard. I, that's the little Bluetooth Apple. Uh, keyboard, yeah, it, right? it's a middle point between what I would want and what the current, the preceding generation of MacBook Pros, which I'm using now, has. And so oh. to me, it's kind of a compromise between the, the Apple way of little travel and having enough that it's actually usable. So it's yeah. it's kind of a happy But medium. to your now point, that, Daniel, I have Stockholm Syndrome because I just keep buying 
Mac laptops, hoping. Yeah, I did buy the 16-inch, the new one, and it's actually usable. It's not yeah, right. great, but it's a lot better than a butterfly key. You so know, the best hope. desktop best desktop for its price is the new Raspberry Pi 4. It's <laughs> <amazing>. <laughs> so, <laughs> really? so, Dan, I had a kid on the radio show. He called me from Palma de Mallorca in Spain. His name is Kai. He was so cute. He was sixth grader, 12 years old. And he calls in. I said, do you live there? He said, yeah, but we're just a little bit. My dad's a tour guide. We're going back to the States in a few months. I said, okay. He said, I have a question about the Raspberry Pi. I have a Raspberry Pi 4. I've already written uh, a voice assistant with it. I said, oh, what do you call it? She, he says, it's called Lola. I said, can you say, hey, Lola? He said, no, it just tells you the time, the weather, Wikipedia, that kind of thing. I want to do face recognition, but I can't get my camera to with Python. Is there a Python library? Guy's 12. Is there a Python library? I want to do face <laughs> recognition on my Raspberry yeah. Pi 4. And this is my awesome. argument. He actually had a deeper voice than that. But <laughs> this is my argument for uh, when a kid, when a 12-year-old says, I want a computer, Dad, don't give him a PC. No, get a, a Raspberry Pi. Yeah, 35 bucks, and you just... Adults, too. Yeah, throw it at them and say, figure it out, kid. <laughs> and they're yeah. motivated. They're going to... I got to play Minecraft on this thing. They'll figure uh, it out. But then they'll never go outside again. Once they learn how to program a Raspberry Pi, they're never going to throw a With coronavirus. And no coronavirus. I will right. stay inside. All right. All right. And, and I will, I will say from personal experience that the keyboard that they send you with the Raspberry Pi that you get yes. from Raspberry Pi is way better than it's the Mac keyboard. It's better than keyboard. a Mac keyboard. It's so good. $35. <laughs> right. That whole desktop kit is like 119 bucks. So the Raspberry Pi, a mouse, a keyboard, and some heat sinks. Do you get a it screen is, or do you see, have look to? At that, look at that keyboard. You don't so get a monitor. Nice. Yes. You have to buy a monitor or use, you know, right. use, use dad's old monitor. Yeah. It's pretty impressive. And the fact that the kid wrote... A voice assistant now wants to work on fake race recognition on a, on a Raspberry Pi. Back to optimism. What? A, yeah, that makes me yes. optimistic. That's really good news. I um, like that we have to turn to like what the kids are doing to get excited because the adults bum us out. Oh but with the kids are like, oh, man, there's well, going to be a good future. All right, cool. You are getting old, Alex, because that's how old people feel. And no, then we I'm, say, get off of my lawn, you kids, with your <laughs> rap music and your bell-bottom pants. I've always been 112 years old at heart. I'm I think just, you're my an old man. Catching up You've slowly always with been my, an yeah. old man. You always have. It's pretty funny. Uh, all right. Um, let's do an see. ad. Okay, let's do an ad. Actually, before we do the ad, let's uh, run the promo. We got a nice little promo for you. Everything you might have missed this week. No, no, wait. This no? is not the promo that this everyone. This is a promo has for this a is, new show we're going to launch. A new show. I don't know anything about it. We're learning about it here together. Watch this. Yes. Is Twit. It's very jazzy. I'm Jason Howell, and I am thrilled to announce my newest show on the Twit Network, Hands On Android. Because let's get real here. You got that Android device, but do you have that Android mojo? Every week, I'm going to bring you new insights into how to use your device, from giving the UI a facelift practicing safe permissions, to securing your phone from intruders. There's tips and tricks for some of the most popular phones. And when a new OS update is released, I plan to do some deep diving. And yes, I'll even review apps that bring a little something special to the platform. All right, look, Android is open, which means its capabilities are wide open. And I'm your tour guide, helping you to use that Android device to the best of its capacity. Hands on Android comes at you every Thursday, and you're going to want to subscribe right now on Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, or your favorite podcatcher to be sure you don't miss any of that magical mojo. And you can find subscribe links galore at twitch.tv slash HOA, the go-to place on the web for Hands on Android. I'll see you there. Yay! No truth to the rumor that I'll be hosting Hands on Neo and Duo, Hond, at any time <laughs> in the future. <laughs> Well, would be I love a good show. Hond. <laughs> and somebody's saying, does this mean Jason won't be doing all about Android? Absolutely not. Jason Jason is doing all about Android, Tech News Weekly, and Hands On Android. That's three shows. He can handle three shows. How many shows a week do I do? I'm asking you. He can handle three shows. So, yeah, no, I'm excited about that. We're going to also launch Hands On Macintosh. I'm going to host that uh, next Ooh. month. And uh, yes, people have asked. The survey says people wanted hands-on Linux, so we're going to do that as well. And uh, I'll be hosting that as well. Um, 
minutes. Speaking of which, it's the last chance to do the survey. We're, we're retiring it on Wednesday. So if you haven't yet done the Twit survey, twit.to slash survey20, or just go to twit.tv. It's on the front page there. It's just a few pages, a couple of questions. It's the only, We don't track you. You know, one of the great things about podcasting is there's no way for us to, to do anything but, but give you nice content and maybe see how many downloads we get. We can't tell anything about you. So this survey helps us both understand you better for our own uses and also for advertising. It's very, we do it once a year and it's very helpful. So twit.to slash survey20. It's completely voluntary. We don't ask for an email or any personal information. We just kind of want to get to know you a little bit better. But it does help us. Thank you. Um, I have to say I'm a little nervous because as Spotify starts to eat the podcast world, <laughs> maybe we'll mm. talk about that next because they just bought yet another big podcast network. And I'm a little nervous that their goal is to track you because if you use it the is. Spotify app, they know everything about you, including your credit card. So we'll talk about that in just a second. Our show today brought to you by Express VPN. If you're you, look, if you travel, if you go around the world, I know Dan, you've worked with journalists to teach them how to operate securely in countries where the government's really keeping an eye on you. A VPN is critical, virtual private network when you're at an online, you know, open access point, a Wi-Fi at the coffee shop or on the cruise ship or at a hotel. The VPN is going to protect your privacy by encrypting everything you do as it egresses your computer and then goes to the VPN server somewhere out there in the world and then into the public Internet. That way, the people in between just can't see you. No man in the middle, no spying. But... If you think about it, you're just kicking the security and privacy can down the road. The VPN server you're using is going to get all the information, too. So you've got to get a VPN company you can trust. And I trust ExpressVPN. They don't log your data. They can't log your data. They can't keep track of what you're doing because they use a technology called Trusted Server. They developed it themselves. When you start a VPN session... And it's easy to do. They've got clients for Android, iOS, Mac, Windows, Linux. When you start a session, it spins up a trusted server uh, on the ExpressVPN uh, address that you're going to, and you can choose anywhere in the world. Spins it up. You use it. When you close that session, it, it spins it down. And the entire time it operates in a sandbox, it cannot write to disk. That means it cannot log anything you're doing and i don't i don't you know i mean yes of course expressvpn says this but i gotta tell you they've had third-party audits that say they had honor their privacy policy that this trusted server works exactly as they say it does we also know from court cases uh where governments in the case of one government turkey they didn't use a warrant they just barged in on the expressvpn took the servers they, there was nothing on them. They couldn't do anything with it. So you don't have to just trust me. You don't have to trust the third parties. Governments have tried and failed. ExpressVPN is also fast, and this is the other reason you're going to want to use it. One of the reasons people use a VPN is to change their geographic location. You can serve, choose the server closest to you, and most of the time you'll do that. But you might also want to choose a server, say, in Japan, so you can watch Netflix Japan. Normally, that is not a good experience. With ExpressVPN, it is because they're very, very fast. I don't know how they're doing it. Maybe it's their servers. Maybe it's their network. But you're able to stream HD quality video with zero lag anywhere in the world. And I know this because I've tried it. I, I actually <laughs> I turned on ExpressVPN, went to Japan, was watching some anime on J Japanese Netflix, and forgot to turn it off. I left ExpressVPN running on my iPad for days. I forgot. And I didn't even notice because it's that fast. It is easy to use, it's fast, it's secure, it's what you want in a VPN, and you don't have to just take my word for it. TechRadar, The Verge, CNET, many other tech experts have rated ExpressVPN number one. You will too. Now, you're going to say, I know I hear it from people, oh, I got a free VPN, this is great. There's no such thing as a free lunch. If you're getting a free VPN, they're doing something to monetize it. Most likely, they're selling your data or they're injecting ads into your stream there are VPN providers that do that. ExpressVPN does not. In fact, we're, the best deal is to sign up for a year and get an extra three months when you go to expressvpn.com slash twit for the best VPN service. You will use it all the time. It's that easy. It's that fast. Expressvpn.com slash twit. It's the one I use, the one I recommend. Expressvpn.com slash twit. Thank you, ExpressVPN, for sponsoring a 
the Twitch show. And thank you, Twit listener, for using that special address, expressvpn.com slash twit. Uh, let's see. Uh, what I used ExpressVPN just last week. There you go. It's, I was in Jamaica, which, by the way, Shout out to Jamaica. I've nice, never been there, huh? but it was nice. amazing. Love Jamaica. Love the people. It was just people are so fantastic. Great. Can't yeah. wait to go back. Yeah. But uh, I wanted to stream TV, and this is a lesson I learned, which is I'm, I've been toying between Sling and YouTube TV recently. Sling mm. on PC, I can use ExpressVPN, and Sling worked beautifully. Isn't that amazing? You don't YouTube expect TV that. would block, though. It worked on the phone, but I, so I was weird. using an iPhone at the time, and an iPhone with a <clears> TV is pointless. So, you know, I was a little concerned because uh, ExpressVPN wanted us to tout how you could use Netflix with ExpressVPN and, and watch Netflix anywhere in the world. And I thought, is that legal? And I checked and Netflix said, yeah, we just we don't like you to do it because it's too slow and you're going to get a bad experience. But it's perfectly legal. You pay it. You have a Netflix account. So yeah. from their point of view, it's fine if you're in Jamaica to, to, to surf to the U.S. with ExpressVPN and as long as you can do it, and, and that's the nice thing. Lou in uh, Lou Moresco's in our chat room says he was in Dubai and used ExpressVPN to watch TV at home, uh, yep. and it worked. So that's a... Yeah, Sling's the I... only one that has worked for me so far. Hulu, and I enjoy Hulu's service, although it's too expensive, so I dropped them, but I couldn't never get them to work through a VPN, any VPN. I, tried I don't many. know how, you know, there's no... Is there a fingerprint? I don't think so. I think that they have to do it by IP address. I'm not yeah. sure how they would know you're on a VPN. I don't think there's. They a always did. But they always do. <laughs> Sling was the only one that yeah. was always able to bypass on PC. So. Well, uh, ExpressVPN says it works with Hulu. Uh, it works with uh, Netflix. It works with. I think they say it works with Sling and YouTube TV too. So they may be yeah. doing something. I don't know. Yeah, I've tried. I've tried with other VPNs, and uh, my kids have tried to like get Tunnel into. Bear, they block immediately. Have tried to get yeah. into Netflix Japan to watch their anime shows, but um, those. Oh, cool my, idea. My my VPN does not work for that. Like they, 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 can, they know they know which uh, IPs. I think that's using it. In Japan. I think they rotate through them, and that's like how right. ExpressVPN. Yeah, do. UFC did that for a little while too. Yeah, <laughs> meanies. <laughs> so, uh, what was I going to ask you, Alex? I was going to ask you about something. Podcasts and Spotify. Oh yeah. So, um, Spotify just bought the Ringer, Bill Simmons Podcast Network. You remember Bill Simmons from ESPN got fired six oh, yeah. month, six years ago because he, <laughs> I guess he was cranky. I don't know. <laughs> and he said, well, screw you, ESPN. I'm going to start a podcast network and do sports quite yes. successfully. 30 shows. They also do a movie uh, you watch along with them. They do a couple of other uh, culture shows. Just sold to Spotify. Can I tell you this was a knife in my heart? Mm. They just Because they're basically the same size as we are. We have 25 shows or something. They have 30. They have 18 million in revenue. We have like 11. Uh, $141 million base. And if they perform and Bill doesn't quit in a huff, $194 million for a freaking wow. podcast network. Uh, Leo, I mean, this is, you're underpaid, is what I'm hearing. I am underpaid. <laughs> what did I do wrong? Um, uh, I, I'm thrilled for Bill. I think it's great. And Ringer's great. And he's done a great job. And it's, they're very good podcasts. They probably have a bigger audience than us because I think more people are into sport ball than technology. Um, however, I'm impressed. <laughs> yeah. So I, I wanted to talk about this because I just got access to the podcast that I'm on with TechCrunch's Spotify analytics. And uh -huh. this was a revelation to what me. What do they know? For, well, what, what I was really fascinated to find out, it has the usual stuff like where you've been downloaded, where you've been streamed, that sort of thing. How many people stream your show, whatever. But the, the data point that it had that I really found fascinating was because they have the player built in, they can tell you how long people are listening to your show yes. as a percentage. And one so thing advertisers out, right? always ask, and I bet they mm -hmm. ask you, is did they hear our ad? Yes. And the, we don't know that. We only know if the show was downloaded. It's like asking a magazine, did they, did they see our ad? I don't know. They got the magazine. I hope they read it. I don't know. You can't yes, prove but now. That. But now I can say, yes, we put in a small teaser ad, say, at, at the 18-minute mark, and we know that 74.5% yes. people were still listening at that point. And the cool thing for me, and this was a, a real like a, a, a weight off my shoulders, was that nearly everyone finishes the show. I was terrified we were going to get this data and find that everyone listened for three minutes and skip right. the whole, you know. Uh, but that was a – it was a data That's point that I didn't know that I wanted to have. But yeah. once I had it, I could not I don't want to know that. <laughs> <laughs> Our shows – how long is your show? Uh, between 25 and 35. Who the hell couldn't finish that? 
Our well, shows maybe, go on and on yeah. and on and on and on. Yes, not but only does this the show. validate the podcast talk. market, it provides a, such a competitive advantage, uh, for better or worse. This well, is, I have a theory. Uh, go ahead, Dan. I, I'll tell you my theory. In a no, second. no, no, your theory. So I have a theory because there's no way if a company makes 18 revenue, not profit, I, they have 90 employees, we have 25. So I think their revenue is probably very, their profit's fairly low. Lower than ours, I would guess. Uh, so there's no way they're worth a hundred times profit. What, is, Alex? You're a bit. You cover business. What's yeah. What's the typical multiple that companies go for? So you're talking about a price earnings ratio, right? And off of 18 million, let's say they made a profit of two million, that'd be a hundred x multiple if they're worth about 200, including right. incentives. Hundred seems insane. high. It seems so high. They're, they're certainly not being valued. On right. their, their Spotify is not saying, potential. oh, we'll make our money back in 100 years. No. What, no but what Spotify is saying is that you will not uh, you will not give up your Bill Simmons, apparently. And you so you will, will stay on to Spotify a Sp subscribers. Yes. Exactly. And we'll put these only on Spotify in time. All you Apple Music dorks don't get them now. So That's ha, right. ha, ha. And at 8, 10, 12 bucks a month, you can make back your money relatively quickly. It's a cool gambit. And, and the, the subtext here, the background is that Spotify's margins, their gross margins are quite low because they don't own the content they stream. So they're stuck about 25%, which doesn't need a lot of changing. They now, and I think part of this is because the record, they're worried, they have the Netflix problem, right? Netflix got got pressured by the movie companies and they couldn't get the good movies, so they ended up making their own and that worked well. So Spotify's looking at that saying, we live at the pleasure of these crap record companies. They could put us out of business anytime. We better have our own content. Yes. And that's exactly. what they're doing. They're making their own content. But I think their only way that, you know, they paid $200 million for Gimlet. They paid almost $200 million for, for Ringer. The mm -hmm. only way these companies are worth that kind of money is if Spotify can corner the podcast yeah. market. They're treating it like it's zero sum. They want to corner the market. And and the, here's, how the, here's the methodology for doing that. And by the way... We will never, I believe in RSS. I want our shows to be everywhere and I want you to be able to use any client you want. That is a problem because we won't have the information about you, but we know our audience doesn't want that. Uh, we won't have the information about you that Spotify has. If Spotify can go to advertisers and say, well, you shouldn't buy ads on Twit, they don't know anything about their audience. We know everything about your audience. We can even tell you if they, how many people heard your Ad and we'll charge you based on that instead. Advertising will dry up for RSS. True podcasts will dry up, and it will only exist for Spotify companies that can tell you that kind of information. And the reason I have this conspiracy theory is that's what happened to the web. Ah, with advertising, yeah. it became yeah. apps. Ad tech, ad tech transformed the web into the junk pile it is today. <laughs> And I fear that it's going to happen to podcasting. And I think the only reason Spotify can say, well, it's worth half a billion dollars to buy all these podcasts because we'll corner the market. And, you know, down the road, all the all the revenue will come to us. I mean, maybe. I mean, Spotify is making a big bet. I mean, Apple's not going to take this uh, laying down. They'll have a similar. It's risky. Product that yeah, there's also Deezer out there. There's still a lot of players. So this isn't a foregone conclusion. But and most podcasters want to want to do what we're doing. I don't think Marco Arment, who makes Overcast, is going to move his podcast to Spotify. That wouldn't ever happen. And so, and we're not. And so I have a feeling that what's going to happen is it's going to be a, a hard battle, but they're going to, but, but the scary thing is they're going to put pressure on us because advertisers, which is our lifeblood, without advertising, we have no revenue. If advertisers buy this plan, mm -hmm. your favorite podcast could go away. I, I I wouldn't worry about Twit though because the Twit audience, so far as I can tell, but having been on the show for you know off and on for a couple of years, is is pretty dedicated. But I think this could really attack the the middle class of podcasting, and that's, not the that's, folks like you guys. Yeah, I'm not worried about for myself, but you're exactly right. I worry very much for the vibrant, exciting podcasting is kind of like the web used to be with blogs and create and, mm -hmm. and anybody wanted to write about stuff and, and often they could get ads. Google kind of constant Google and Facebook concentrated it all and ended up kind of squeezing. Uh, all those middle middle tier and low tier stuff. You can either do it as a hobby or 
or you or you have to join somebody big because there's nowhere in the middle to live. And I think that's what's going to happen. To, I worry that's what's going to happen to podcasting. It's going to be too bad. A lot of a lot of really fun independent creators will lose their revenue streams, and then the work will become a little bit too much. I mean, podcasting people don't realize is tons of work. Um, editing guests distribution analytics sales i mean like it's not a simple uh process and if the revenue goes down that might just not be worth it for this kind of you know middle 80 percent of the podcast market which is a huge chunk of the shows people enjoy and love but aren't big enough to probably right. get past this lack of data uh but spotify the, the data they give you isn't always good or welcome because i was told the uh, the artists that equity listeners my podcast uh what they listen to and it was disappointing so I, I but advertisers don't fans. care if you're disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> advertisers want to know that, and they're going to say to you, you know, we're not going to pay what you're asking because I can. I'm looking at, you know, what I'm saying is that this is yeah. this is all about empowering advertisers and disempowering content creators. Okay, but one last point on that: because we have the information from Spotify, we can kind of presume that that works across other platforms, right? So because we know Spotify says on Spotify, you have an 80% listener rated at 30 minutes or whatever it is, right? Then I can kind of say, well, probably the same thing on Apple Podcasts and so forth. So I can actually use the Spotify data if I'm smart oh, to good. talk about my other platform and then maybe give myself more firepower. A temporary Band-Aid to your broader point, but I'm, I'm hoping that there's some, some wiggle room there for, for folks like my show, which isn't huge, but also isn't small. Right. It's an inter. I don't know. I it, this is kind of inside baseball. I'm sorry I brought it up. I'm just jealous. <laughs> I mean, I want 200 million dollars as well. So I tell you what, Spotify, if you want to buy equity, yeah. we all got a we'll number. Do it for 20 don't million. We? That's it. This guy. <laughs> we all got a number. Deal. Yeah. Um, Susan Wojcicki. It's kind of related. Says that YouTube has paid the music industry more than three billion dollars last year in ad revenue. Where for the first time ever, the you, Google Alphabet has been forced to reveal information about YouTube. About yes, you know, and this and it's all it's quite interesting. It's the first. Isn't this a lot of the money. same conversation? I mean, YouTube is effectively a, a large podcast yeah, platform. Exactly. And Google sells you or offers a ten dollar a month subscription. Right. YouTube ads generated fifteen billion in revenue in fiscal twenty nineteen. Fourth quarter was four point seven two billion. Um, and it paid it actually paid a surprisingly I don't have the sh numbers in front of me but they did for the first time I think say how much of that revenue went to creators did they uh, Alex I can't remember I forget if that was broken up that would be a cost of revenue number I believe for that right. so that should be disclosed eventually but I, I was surprised by the scale of YouTube I thought it was going to be quite large in the billions but I didn't think it was going to be you know just under five billion in Q4 alone that's amazing. Um, yeah, I, and I'm really curious about the breakdown of, of who makes that money because if you look at some accounts on on YouTube, they're shockingly large. Uh, Eminem just did a big thing on Twitter and social media about one of his videos re reaching a billion views. Uh, you know, five, six years ago, a billion views was, I think, you know, not even something that happened yet, let alone one artist can have several videos at a billion or more. So the scale of YouTube, I think we underestimate um, as an industry and as a group of uh, of watchers of, of tech. And I think that there's been more cultural growth there than we kind of give Google slash Alphabet credit for. And the revenues followed it. And and and, and dang, $15.5 is a lot of money for, for Google. That's a yeah. big chunk of their growth in the last couple of years, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it's, Huge. To put it in perspective, it makes them bigger than Discovery Channel. <laughs> I, I'm not surprised. <laughs> it doesn't wow. make them NBC, CBS, ABC size. It makes them Discovery Channel size. You yeah, know, I think in part of it's, I mean, they're going after now. That's that's the funny thing. YouTube used to be all about that independent creator, and now they're they're going after the big corporate money, right? All yeah. the big networks, and that's what the big complaint about YouTube is. It's You go to the front page, and now it's NBC, CBS. It's clips from The Late Show. It's... It's it's getting away from almost the smaller independent stuff, but I imagine YouTube sees that revenue coming in from having this content, and the fact is, a lot of people that's how they get they don't watch the the full TV say, show though, live. Uh, you know? Marquez Brownlee, MKBHD, just interviewed Bill Gates. I mean, that's a huge get. Mm -hmm. uh, 
that video I showed from Jerry Rig Everything where he destroys a $1,400 phone. He can afford it. He's got five and a half million subscribers. That video alone came out yesterday, has half a million views. Ooh. The numbers are massive on YouTube. Yeah. There's, what is it, an 18-year-old who makes, uh, I mean, an eight-year-old, I'm sorry, an eight-year-old <laughs> who makes like 13 million a year on YouTube? Yeah, for the kid reviews or whatever. Yeah. I think the problem is, though, it's sort of like, you know, we uh, hold up the Brownleys and everybody and we look at that and like, wow, that's amazing. But the question is, what's the entry? You There's know, a for long a new tail yeah. isn't there. Yeah, because right. those people have been doing it for a long time. Like they got in early 2012. Mm. They've been doing it and really slogging it through. And that's probably one of the hardest things about YouTube is is being consistent. Right. It, it's not just being a hit. It's being hit and then coming back next Tuesday, next Thursday, next Tuesday, next right. and always doing it for years. Right. And what you end up having, of course, is people learn, you know, that actually it's really hard to do a, a successful YouTube channel because you have to be – that's all you have to do. If you take time off, it's it can ruin it, just like game streaming, right? So um, – but I do question whether or not it, it still has that same – you know, if you want to go do that today, could you do that, right? I think it's – it's increasingly difficult. And now having corporate customers come into the mix, you're competing with that. It's it's getting really uh, hard. Dan, last time we talked to you, you were, I think, pretty concerned about uh, the security of political campaigns, uh, a concern that's been borne out oh. over the last few uh, campaigns. Uh, you've done have, was it you who do, were training uh, campaigns and teaching them how to secure themselves? I know you did that for reporters and uh, dissidents. Yeah, I've never done that for U.S. political campaigns. I've also never been a Republican or a Democrat uh, because I cover these campaigns. You can't. Yeah. Um, it, it's like right, me right. buying Apple and, stock. You just can't do it. Right. It's all about trust. And right. and if I'm a partisan one way or the other. Um, Boy, are you old-fashioned. <laughs> yeah. I have certainly – I have worked in Darfur and Egypt and the UAE and trained journalists and um, uh, migrants in those countries not just how to create media but how to use encryption on their mobile Good. devices yes. so that they can stay safe and secure. Um, but in U.S. politics, I will cover the security of election systems uh, but and the elections but certainly not take a side either way. I have to say I'm proud of Google there offering free uh, security keys to U.S. political campaigns. Um, these are made in China. <laughs> just, just might want to point out. But, uh, yeah, I think that's a that's an important uh, thing. I actually use Google's advanced protection uh, on my uh, Google accounts. And it limits a lot of the things I'd like to do, like embedding uh, Google Docs and so forth. But uh, I do it because, you know, that's the, the, the there's a few accounts I, I cannot afford to get you know, given away, get get hacked, and that's one of them. So using these keys, I think, is a really uh, good idea. And I would hope that uh, campaigns, if they're still using Gmail, are using advanced protection. I mean, talk about being a target. I mean, the yeah. entire world wants to get it. I mean, it's not just one nation state now. It's a collection of them that are all going to come after you. Um, this is why after uh, so much um, me putting it off, I finally moved to a password manager and joined the 21st Yay. century. Oh, yeah. 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 Two, points, as two we, points to me. As we come to you late, from you know. the Twit Last Pass Studios. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm actually a and Last Pass and one password customer. So there you go. How well, about that? that? You're going to have to pick one. It gets really confusing if you use more <laughs> yeah. than one. I have to because I review handle. I review other ones. Uh, but I realize that the real risk is I'm going to put a password in one and it's not uh -huh. going to be in the other. So uh, I use Last Pass and I just said, you know what? I'll let somebody else review uh, all the other ones. But there, I there are segregate many good, just like Alex does. You, uh, some bi business yeah, and yeah. personal. Yeah. No, yeah, uh, I have I, that too. I put yeah. different priority of uh, passwords in in different password managers simply because I mean the same reason. Like if one password is compromised, another one. Ah. At oh, least that's clever. A of Instead of trusting just um, one. Yeah, not just LastPass or 1Password. Oh, those those are sense. my two favorites. Yeah. Um, and we should, you know, per election security, this, this is certainly not about politics, but there are adversaries who uh, have particular strategic goals. And the strategic goal of Russia is not necessarily – this is incredibly important. We should care about voting machines and election systems and that kind of thing. Uh, but really, the strategic goal is to undermine our faith and confidence in the mechanisms of democracy That's as key. well as election yes. systems. It would be naive to think that their goal is to get one or other candidate That's elected. exactly right. That's not their and goal. Their goal is to create chaos. Yes, and that's exactly right. There was a New York Times article where the headline was chaos is the point, and that is the point. And to that 
And we need to pay attention to more than we shouldn't over index on the hardware of election systems. We should pay attention to those, but we should also pay attention to things like influence operations, uh, the use of, of propaganda and uh, undermining the way Americans feel and liberal democracy feels about in the integrity of our election systems. This is incredibly important because we will see all of these under attack through 2020 and beyond. Uh, I want to take a quick break. There is so much more to talk about, and we're already at the two-hour mark. So let me get a break in, and then we'll, I'll try to do about 20 stories in five minutes here if I can. Yeah, and guys, I love you, Leo. You're great. Do you great. have to take I off, gotta, Dan? Uh, hop All right. off. Yeah, 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 but you guys are fantastic. Uh, Daniel a pleasure. and Alex, I learned so much from you. Leo, Thank you, you as well. So I appreciate thanks. it. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, stick Dan. around, you two, though. Alex uh, Wilhelm from uh, TechCrunch and Daniel Urbino from uh, Windows Central, if you can, because there are a few more things, and I'd love to get your uh, take on it. Our show today brought to you by Health IQ. Health IQ is interesting. It's a life insurance agency that specializes in healthy people. So as you probably know, thanks to statistics, to actuarial statistics, healthy people essentially pay for the unhealthy people. Uh, but the problem is you deserve better rates. If you take care of yourself, if, if you do everything right for your health, you exercise you know, every day or four times a week, you get a minimum of eight hours of sleep, you're, you're eating right, you know what to do, you're taking care of yourself, you ought to get a lower rate. But how do you get that lower rate? Uh, I always use as an example Aunt Pruitt, one of our hosts, who is a lifter. His body mass index is in the 30s which any insurance company is going to say, well, you're obese. He's not obese. He's got a 29-inch waist. He's got 29-inch biceps. That's the problem. And because his BMI is so high, that number to an insurance company is meaningless. You need Health IQ. They're basically a concierge service for people like Ant. They go to the insurance companies. They say, no, 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 wait a minute. <laughs> Ant's not obese. Ant's fit. Health IQ uses science and data to secure lower life insurance rates for people like you. And as an example, you can get a million-dollar life insurance policy for $36 a month. There's no reason to pay more. You just got to let your insurance company know. In fact, Health IQ... It works with the top 30 insurance companies and gets rates that are exclusive to Health IQ because these companies know Health IQ is selective. The way it starts is with the Health IQ quiz. They've created an assessment. It's not a self-assessment. It's a knowledge assessment online. You can take it at healthiq.com slash twit. They put this together with the nation's leading medical health and fitness experts. Now, depending on your score, after you take the quiz... And there's other related qualifying factors. In fact, they, they say, you know, if, if you want to give us your Fitbit info, that'll help, you know, you know, that kind of thing. You can save up to 41% on your life insurance premiums compared to other providers. That's almost half off. No commitment. Uh, you give them your phone number. You take the quiz. You talk to the concierge who's going to help you get the insurance you deserve. And you'll learn about other opportunities to be rewarded, too, for your commitment to learning healthy, living healthy. So it's a it's a really great deal. It's a lot of fun. Take the quiz, healthiq.com slash twit. Once you complete the quiz, you, the team will walk you through the process. You get the savings you've earned for your healthy lifestyle. Healthiq.com slash twit. And it's fun. Take the quiz, and, uh, and you'll see how much you can save. Healthiq.com slash twit. Uh, oh, I don't know. Elizabeth, this is a big one. Elizabeth Holmes got the Theranos, uh, Theranos conspiracy charges thrown out on Wednesday. I saw that. Uh, the <laughs> judge, uh, it's, there, there's really, it's a case against Theranos founder Elizabeth Holmes. Remember, she uh, claimed that she had a way to uh, do blood tests with just a drop of blood. It turned out it didn't work. <laughs> she and her company, not even close, not even close <laughs> uh, her company president, uh, Sonny Balwani, were on trial, but the judge has thrown out some of the charges. The defense team argued prosecutors' case was too broad and too vague. The defense team tried to get all 11 charges thrown out, saying that the, the, the charges were full of ambiguity and fudging language. Good lawyers. Uh, mm -hmm. The judge did rule that they can't charge Holmes and Balwani with conspiracy to defraud doctors and patients. Since but the they're still up for wire fraud. Yeah, so. the insurance paid for those tests, so uh, the patients weren't harmed. The judge also threw out 
charges claiming the duo conspired to have doctors make fraudulent statements. I don't know. Um, but they are only off the hook for the conspiracy charges. They still face nine counts of wire fraud. And that trial begins <laughs> August 2020. Uh, what a story I, that is, you know? Yeah, so I, I read the book Bad Blood on a flight. Wasn't that a good so I, book? Oh, man. It was. I, but I had this, you know, multi-hour period of time. I just sat down in the SFO and I finished it when I landed in Boston. And uh, it was an amazing story to read uh, back to back. And I ended up watching some of the the films that are out there about it. I think there's a documentary as well. Yeah. Um, if they don't end up with some jail time, my personal non-legal view, this is just an opinion, I'm not trying to say anything more than that, is that uh, it was going to encourage more people to be this uh, sketchy with the truth. Yeah, why not take a uh, chance if, you know. Why not? Yeah. You know, it's just a reputation, that's it. But I mean, if they, because they spent a lot of money, they raised a lot of money, they spent a lot of money, they projected huge revenues, they had essentially no revenues. Uh, you know, this is like as stretched as things can get, if not blatantly false and, and fraudulent. So Do you think I'm there's other f other companies in the tech space, Don't you don't even have to name names, that are doing something <laughs> similar? Uh, uh, there has to be. In the startup field, there yeah. has to be. Yeah, there are yeah. a lot of them, I think. Yeah, I think that's right. I think we saw you biome fall apart. I think um, it's not just biotech. Kind of be... I mean, there's some names people know that are probably full of it. Yeah, I think a I lot think of companies is... that claim AI are not actually AI yeah. whatsoever. Right. I think they're yeah. actually just using humans behind the scene to to create the illusion of a more intelligent go. computing systems. That's what Theranos was doing. Basically, they were using other people's machines yeah. to do the blood assays. Yeah, I think Daniel, you were going to uh, Alex is probably very good to speak at this, but as, as a someone who doesn't cover this stuff, this is the way I see. It. I always find venture capital and startups strange because I remember back in the day where you used to have to make a product, you go to the market and sell the product, and then you took the money you made from that product and invested back That's in your company. That's crazy talk, Daniel. And you just kept doing that, but at least there was a product that you were actually selling, and you can make projections versus this idea of like, well, we got this idea for this thing, and if you just give us money, we can actually make it. Like I, I get that as a bank loan to start your business. But this idea that these companies just take billions or millions at least and, you know, and, and mm -hmm. give, you know, there's supposed to be a billion dollar company on the promise of someday we may figure out a business model how to make money off of this is just so weird to me. Like, I'm yeah. not even like, I, I, you know, my politics are pretty lefty, but like when it comes to that, like, all right, we're going to have capitalism. But what is this thing? This isn't really capitalism anymore. It's some weird you know, there's a book out right now, Lab Rats, which I'm reading, uh, oh, which isn't is that really good? good. Yeah. Yeah. And that's like just a page turner. But it goes through talking about how, yeah, these companies now, you know, they build up, they take the money and then they sell off and they run off. You know, it's just I don't know. It feels kind of weird to yeah. me. Yeah. OK, so the, some general thoughts about that. One, I, I, I hear where you're coming from. Um, yeah. There has been an explosion in the amount of venture capital that has been available and so that has led to some silly things being funded, but that shouldn't um, make you think that the the venture model itself is uh, is always a bad idea or always not a good fit for certain companies. Um, what it lets you do is hire very far ahead of your company's revenues if you have an idea that could have broad application. And so yeah. with this uh, kind of capital acceleration, you can go to market more quickly, take market share, disrupt incumbents, and do a lot of the stuff that we kind of applaud. And, and who loses money? The only people who lose money are these rich venture capitalists. So it's not like the, there's harm done. Well, well careful the, though, the because they raise from they raise from CalPERS, they raise from university oh. funds, they raise from that well, that's sort of CalPERS' thing. fault. Which that's by the way the retirement fund for uh, Cal California state. Right, state but state they put in a small amount of the, the, their uh, overall asset pool into kind of more there exotic investments. Yeah, of they should be that's smart well. because if you hit a Google, right. you know you, you're you're multiple I can think be that's, huge. That's what drives it, right? It's just yeah. the idea of Facebook, right, or even WhatsApp, right? The, that there are these companies that created a product. Then it got valued and sold for a ton of money. But then we just saw this week, what was that that HQ trivia app? HQ, you know? that's that another story. We're going to do obituaries. <laughs> HQ. Yeah, you know. Scott Rogowski, <laughs> smart. He got out of there before uh, before it got. He said well, a little Twitter thing he had, ooh, too, with the. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, in fact, the last HQ, that was the trivia thing. Did all, we all did it, right? We. It, I never played it. Oh, yeah. I never oh, played it. Like it. Crazy. Really? It was yeah, so much I fun. I got my whole family once in Sunnyvale to yeah, play. Yeah, you stand in a circle and you yep. and then everybody does it. It was streaming. It was uh, lots of money, and it was. 
The problem is the first six questions were really easy, and the next six were really, really hard. Like impossibly hard. It was like, I'm smart, I'm smart, I'm smart, I'm, an I'm Indian. smart. I'm the dumbest person alive. Bergowski made it fun. He left pretty early on. Uh, the management was insane, apparently. And their yeah. last HQ trivia this week was a drunken brawl. <laughs> I didn't I, see wait, it. Wait, what? I, I didn't hear about that. They had a farewell episode that involved a considerable amount of champagne and cussing. <laughs> oh, uh, that just sounds like old twit. Um, yeah, it's, but it's I mean, like that's an show. example of a. It's an example of like you take an idea that has an explosive amount of like consumer demand for it, put some capital behind it, and then maybe it becomes something that's quite large. But it, um, but it's a problem is case, when you have one hit, you only have one thing. And mm -hmm. remember, OMG pop. Remember, draw something. Oh yeah, they had oh, that yeah. big hit. It was so a fake. It was these. a Pictionary clone. They had one yeah. one app. It was a huge hit. They were smart. They got Zynga to come along and buy them for a hundred dollars. Zynga is another good example. And then yeah. it was God, bye bye. <laughs> they lost but all their money. Just to put a cap on this, back to Daniel's original point about kind of what's a good fit for VC and kind of where this model fits. Game studios, which we're essentially talking about here, these kind of app-based hits are traditionally not considered to be good investments for no. VCs for this reason. Right. Uh, and that's why VCs like enterprise software, which is long and during revenues and repeatability and so forth. Um, that is it said, naive of me to have thought that the best thing you can do is have no revenue because then the multiple is whatever you want it to be. If as soon as you have revenue, then people say, well, you're only worth 10 times your revenue. Right. So that's that's the case when things are incredibly loose and that's, your company that's is when very you're in a hot. bubble. It's a bubble. Yes. Yeah. So historically, bubble. there was a moment when are we snap, in a bubble? Mm -hmm. uh, we are in a it's a, so it's really weird so the answer is yes but not in the 2000 sense it isn't going right. to be this moment of like implosion and then 10,000 companies evaporate what's going to happen is there's going to be a slowdown in economic growth uh, globally it's going to lead to a deceleration in venture capital investing and a lot of companies that were worth a lot of money on paper are going to be forced to really fight for smaller right. amounts of money at lower valuations and that's going to be a, a, a sea change that we're maybe starting to see in the rubble of the vision fund um but i'm, I'm a little bit off topic for twit but i mean that's something that i'm keeping close eyes on well, i know I'm you're, you're a money guy and we like to have somebody who knows about money on once in a while <laughs> uh andy rubin Raised three hundred thirty oh. million dollars for Essential. Remember, Andy mm -hmm. was the invented Android. Google bought him. Google fired him. Google gave him ninety million dollars to leave without <laughs> making any noise. Uh, and he started raised a lot of money because he's got a good reputation, except with the ladies, as and, a technologist. Uh, as a, as a technologist, and uh, so he raised three hundred thirty million dollars. Got valued at a billion dollars because he was going to make the next big thing. Came out with the essential phone, which I which liked. Was interesting. It was I liked interesting. it. Yeah. Uh, the, ca the I think it got hurt because the camera crashed. Yeah. a lot in the first few mm -hmm. months. They fixed it, but it was too late. Right. Also, they were going to make those little. Add on adapters. Add ons. Yeah, they just had one, I think. Yeah, the little blocks things yeah. that were gonna like. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, they were gonna do a home uh, automation hub that never came out. And then they announced this little new gem too, which was a weird f candy bar. Is a rethinking of like what a phone would be for. Yeah. And then they went under. <laughs> they're they're an interesting company. I think Andy, you know, he he had he stayed behind the scenes. And just done the investment in this and let someone else be the front facing of the company. I think it would have fared better, but yeah. like he just got ended up getting in the way of the messaging. And that's all the stories, you know. And if you criticized him, he would block you on Twitter. And it was just like it was just it was the wrong way to run a company. You know, it's a shame because they did have good ideas. But then it also goes to tell you it's really, really hard, no matter who you are, to come into the smartphone market in 2018 yeah, yeah. or later. And make something that's they going made, to catch on. It had any other company made it, it would have been a, probably a successful phone. But you can't yeah. just or at least more market. successful. Right. I don't know if it yeah. would have. They survived, only but sold. Are, I can't remember the number. It was like ten thousand. I was one of yeah, them. Some yeah, some very yeah. small thing. This yeah. reminds me a lot of the small British automaker who like starts up in a shed and like builds a cool car, but can't compete with like Lamborghini and Ferrari and BMW. You know, there's a history of these smaller manufacturers, okay. and I think we're seeing that in the smartphone world. Um, and that man is Carol Shelby. No, well, Carol Shelby worked out. You can still get Shelby Brennan and so yes. forth. He <laughs> did. Putting that V8 in that weird car, that worked. Uh, but there, most most small auto manufacturers don't historically. And I think we're going to yeah. see a repeating trend here. And even the smartphone market is so competitive, we're seeing other players, I think like Xiaomi, struggle. LG uh, and L yeah, LG, HTC are on sure. their way out. All right. Yeah. Well, what about this 
The judge says, tells all the state attorneys general in the D.C., it's okay. Ah. T-Mobile and Sprint, they're okay because I like John Ledger. <laughs> no one I likes mean, John. <laughs> yeah, that's true. The judge liked ju Judge was impressed. Judge said John will keep the prices down. We so the reason so the FCC and the FTC they've all approved. Gov you federal governments approved the Sprint T-Mobile merger, but then there were ten state attorneys general who sued, saying it's going to kill competition. We need f more, not fewer, cell phone companies. The judge threw it out. He ruled in favor of the twenty-six billion dollar merger um, on Tuesday. There's still yep. one little speed bump, the California Public Utilities Commission. For some reason, they have to approve it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why, but they do. Um, there w uh, I, was it, is it Neelai who wrote uh, a, a kind of scathing piece? in the? It's always Neelai when it comes it's to this gotta stuff. Be, that's why I'm just assuming it was Neelai. A scathing piece about the judge and his uh, kind of how can Views I on Sprint. I could put it charitably. Yeah, he he didn't. He, he first of all, he said Sprint's failed. A failed, <laughs> a failed. I mean, it's over for Sprint anyway. We got to let him merge. Uh, <sighs> basically, uh, was it was it Eli? I can't tell. Yeah, it was. He says yeah, the court let T-Mobile buy Sprint because Sprint completely sucks. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not wrong. I mean, T-Mobile and Sprint were always sort of the two worst, right? It was like all right, and I would argue actually T-Mobile is the better you know, coverage right now, but Sprint's cheap, you know, so there's that. Um, I mean, it's not wrong, but yeah. that's not, that's a still a bad he reason. Did, he too, did I pull think. out some quotes by the uh, Judge Marrero that made him sound like maybe less than astute. Uh, yeah. He yes. said, adjudication of antitrust disputes virtually turns the judge into a fortune teller. Deciding such cases typically calls for a judicial reading of the future. Who knows, says no, Eli, what the future right. hold. <laughs> um, he says the party's uh, conflicting engineering, economic, and scholarly business models essentially cancel each other out as evidence. What? So I can't use that. Uh, he said, we, he's basically saying, we just, we don't know. How can we tell uh, what the future history. will hold? History. History. We says, can look at history. Says, They're not going to raise prices. Why would they? Yes, they are. Why would they do that? And furthermore, I guess he believed that Charlie Ergen and Dish could create a fourth cell phone company, which something everybody agrees is probably highly unlikely, although that was the, yeah. that was the plan. Um. No one's forming new companies. They're just merging and consolidating. Yeah. It's yeah. That time's over. He says uh, the new leadership team at T-Mobile, John Ledger, instituted an innovative strategy and culture referred to as the uncarrier. Ooh, I like that. So anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> can, can, I, can I ask you guys a question? Because yes. I, I just want to make sure that I'm not totally insane here. Um, yes. We had four. Now we have three. That's still competition, I'm, right? Ish. It's, ish. it's getting closer to a duopoly. Okay. We're expecting prices to go up, innovation to go down, and competition to decrease, right? right. And history okay, tells so all, us that's pretty much what always happens. Right. So we don't need to consult the future, Mr. Judge. We no. can just look at the past, which is- Look at the Comcast The major. old future. Yeah. You know, And we're still fighting. I mean, most of us just want these companies anyway to be dumb pipes- and they're still, you know, it's better, I would say, today than it was a few years ago. But it's still not quite there yet. Will you know? there, but, though, Daniel, you cover this. Wouldn't, won't there, wouldn't this be good for T-Mobile and Sprint customers? Like, they'll be better, they'll have better coverage and networks and it'll all be better now? Possibly. Yeah, I mean, it, it could work out. I mean, it, it's an interesting position. I, like I said, I mean, Sprint... Who knows how Sprint lo how much longer they could have persisted? That's, that's right? really what I think. I think Sprint really was kind of falling. So, so I thought Sprint was really bad, but my 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 wife has Sprint. I guess now she'll have Sprint Mobile, whatever the hell it is. Um, if I don't bring her over to where I am, but I uh, it was fine. T Sprint, T yeah, Sprint, yeah. Sprint could do well. Sprint's fine. My areas. mom has Sprint in Providence as well. Sprint's good yeah. in Providence. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I gave her my Sprint phone because it was unusable in Northern California. <laughs> but it's fun. that's the thing. If you're in Kansas City, Sprint's great. So it's not fair yeah. to say Sprint sucks generally. Right. Uh, T-Mobile's bad some places, right? T-Mobile yeah. sucks in some places. Yeah. I mean, it, it really still depends a lot on that. Um, How about know, Sprint has a deal with Spur always connected Mobile. PCs. Spur yeah. Mobile? They have a, 
No, no. That, that's not any better. That's worse. <laughs> you can't get mad at me for laughing at the, the, the brick in the pants joke and then make a sperm joke and expect me to be the Spr-mobile. one who tackles her. Spr-mobile. Sprinty. Sprinty. It is mint mobile. I mean, there's still the MVNO stuff that seems to be doing quite there's well, There's competition. Right? And there even, Immense. there's US Cellular. There are some small carriers in there. Boost Mobile is still Boost around, mobile. which is bizarre. But, and aren't they but, owned by Sprint? No? Yeah, I believe. Well, yeah, I don't some are owned by, have. some are MVNOs, some Sprint? are owned. And Wait, then there are some independent, small yeah. carriers out there. I think, uh, I don't remember what the names are of them are. That's the problem. I mean, yeah, because I, I wouldn't use a smaller provider because I'm, mission, phones are mission critical for me. Right. But, um, Right. I've used AT&T and Verizon my my adult life, and they've both been pretty good. So, like, you know, I'm fine with yeah. that. But I think they're good because they knew there was competition. They're also expensive. And that if they, well, yeah, but I mean, that's just a cost of life now. I feel I don't think about that too much. But I mean, with with competition from below to cement their their higher status and their ability to charge higher prices, they had to be better. And now with with less competition in general and probably less business model innovation, you know, call T-Mobile what you will, a gimmick or not. Um, I, I'm pessimistic about uh, the future of this industry compared to what it could have done with more competition because I'm a capitalist at heart, and I think this was a mistake. But but there's always uh, that's the internal contradiction of capitalism, of which there's tons of them. But everybody wants competition in capitalism. But if you're a business, you don't want competition. <laughs> your your goal is to destroy your competition or to absorb them. So there's always yes. this weird like tension between these systems where. Yeah, as consumers, we want the competition. If you're AT and T, you definitely you're not like yeah, we should have com-. no. You you would if you could put Verizon out of business right now, AT and T would do that in a heartbeat, right? So I, please I don't, don't know do how that. you reconcile those two things. <laughs> it's it's weird. Well, I mean, it's 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 very it's very clear when you're when you're a upstart, you're a capitalist. When you're incumbent, you're a statist. And that's when yeah. you begin to spend a lot more money on lobbying the government. And as we've seen from the technology industry right. in the last five or ten years, there's been a skyrocketing in uh, amount of capital spent on, on lobbying and building out Washington-based teams because these companies are now worth a trillion dollars plus, and they do not want to have uh, future regulations bring them down. And uh, right. it's it's under it's an undertold story in tech in the last five ten years that I think people should pay more attention to because you're not wrong. Um, these companies are uh, are are as greedy as they uh, they're designed to be, which is very. Right. By just yep. dent of the system we live in, which and, is fine. To be clear, I'm a capitalist. And, and then there, speaking of capitalists, there's the richest man in the world, <laughs> Jeff Jesus. Bezos, who just bought a $165 million house in Los Angeles. It is the most valuable personal home in the country. <laughs> there he is with his <laughs> uh, his girl pal, could- uh, Lauren Sanchez, standing in front of the new Versailles. Why does it Must look terrible, nice. though? Go- can you go to that picture on the video and look at the look at the the brickwork around that crappy pond they have? Well, it looks like repair it looks that. terrible. Yeah. Um, also, I don't know if, if I that's have, I don't know if that's his house. Upper. I don't know where this is. But <laughs> okay. the, to put it in perspective, by the way, The Verge points out that it's only one eighth of a percent of his net worth. It's like if you made sixty thousand dollars a year and you bought a house for seventy five bucks. <laughs> and he just sold four billion dollars oh, of Amazon stuff. So he can fix uh, the brickwork. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He's got a little pocket change for billion. Um, I think because yeah, a billion of that is going to his rocket company. You know, as well. Speaking <laughs> what, of internet, I mean, that, really, the real competition isn't going to be Sprint, T-Mobile, AT and T, or, or Verizon. It's going to be SpaceX. There you go. And uh, Blue Origin, as they both put up Starlink, the SpaceX project. I don't know what Blue Origin is yeah. called. They want to have, you know, gigabit internet everywhere for every square inch of the planet. And honestly, what do you need a cell phone for if you've got gigabit internet right? yeah that's um th- 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 i like this idea but it also seems very complicated there's already a lot of space junk up in space and oh uh, you know, space is a big place you put- <laughs> yeah but not around our orbit like, space I mean, space is China- bigger than than alex's basement it's got there's lots gravity. of room down there you saw gravity I, I, when uh <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Somebody. Something hits you, it's bad news. Yeah, you can always tell when Twit reaches the two and a half hour mark because we get comments like "Space is big. It's big. It's, big. Fine. it's huge. Don't worry about it's it. It's unimaginably huge. It's um, it's giant." Can, also, can we talk about the graphics on Twit? The the spinning gifts they sometimes go through. You like those? You like that? I'm obsessed. Yeah. I, Kevin, I Kevin King, watching. ladies and gentlemen, our technical give it up director. For our new technical director. We had decided uh, that we should make Carson produce the show, and Kevin just push buttons randomly. And it's worked out quite well, I think. Uh, yeah, I'm going to let you guys go. There's a, there's so much more we could talk about, but God damn it, it's a long show. And, and, and we, <laughs> we want people to listen as long as they listen to Alex's show. 
So uh, twenty five minutes. 25 if that's the minutes. case, we're all in trouble. <laughs> I think the way people digest twit is uh, as you would digest any giant meal, spreading it out throughout the week. Yeah, yeah, that wouldn't surprise me. No, uh, you are you are uh, considering you live in my childhood home. I was really hoping you were going to do the show from my old bedroom up on so up the there on the third floor. The reason why I'm not up on the the upper floor of the house is because the Wi-Fi connection is not as good. It and was I never good it, when I was a kid either. Well, it didn't exist when I was a child. No. But other than that, I had um, string you know, and Carson cans. And I, yeah. Carson and I did a, a check of my my Wi-Fi, and the office here has like 400 megabits up and down. So that's why I'm. Oh, do you here. have Verizon FiOS? I believe we have Verizon FiOS, but my, my mom brother just got it. I was so jealous. I'm looking mm -hmm. at I, she has an Eero, so I can look at her bandwidth. And the bandwidth test yesterday was 30 megabits down, two up. And she mm -hmm. said, "Oh, honey, I just the guy came in and just connected everything." I said, "Oh, let's see what your bandwidth is. 492 megabits down." Uh, yeah. So how much I you paying, Verizon. Mom? Forty dollars. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, I've got 400 and change down right now, and I'm also Jeez. live streaming to this at the same time. So yeah. it's, it's pretty fantastic, yeah. and that's why that's wireless, really not even wired. By the way, that's why you're not going to use uh, Skylink for your phone because it requires a dish about 18 inches wide, yeah. and unless you want to wear that on your back, it's just it's not going to be a good cell phone. Dude, sign me up. I know, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> so great to see you too, Dan Rubino. Daniel Rubino is editor, executive editor at uh, Windows Central. Always a pleasure to have you on, Daniel underscore Rubino on the Thank Twitter. You. Anything you got going here. you want to plug? Uh, go, you know, builds coming up. That's the big thing now that Mobile World Congress is gone. So, yeah. uh, you know, we're just focusing a lot on Windows 10X and uh, foldables and dual screens. That's the the theme this year. So great we'll be co coverage. covering a lot of that this yeah, year. Really great coverage on Windows Central of, uh, of that. So I, I, I appreciate it. Thank you both for uh, joining us. Thanks also to Dan Patterson from CBSN and uh, CBS Interactive and CNET. Thanks uh, to all of you for being here. We do Twit every Sunday afternoon, about 2.30 Pacific, 5.30 Eastern, 22.30 UTC. You can uh, watch it live. There's a couple of ways. You can join us in the studio. We had a great studio audience. Wow. From, from all over the place. We had uh, uh, Matt visiting from uh, the Lucas Ranch. We had Arun from Dallas. Matt and Brian from Mountain View. Is there a tech company in Mountain View? trying to remember uh and john and uh, mari from uh, stockton california and uh, it's great to have all of you also mike who's celebrating christmas for some reason in february this is his christmas present his family allowed him to come to twit i think that's really nice from highland california thanks to all of you if you want to be in our studio audience easy to do just email tickets at twit.tv and send me a hundred dollars no <laughs> no, there's no charge. It's absolutely free. Uh, I just can't guarantee uh, a comfy seat. But other than that, it's absolutely free. We'd love to have you in studio. Or watch our live stream anywhere in the world, twit.tv slash live. There's audio and video there. If you are watching live, you should join us in the chat room, as Matt does on a regular basis, irc.twit.tv. We also have, of course, every show we do on demand at the website, twit.tv, audio and video. My suggestion, subscribe. Even if it's in Spotify, subscribe. That way you'll get the show automatically the minute it's available. And you can listen at your convenience. We want to be everywhere you want to listen. You can use, even use your Amazon Echo or your Google Home and just and say, play this week in tech, and it'll play the latest version. Thanks for joining us, everybody. We'll see you next time. Another twit is in the can. Bye-bye.